go live. I, you know. I've already gone live. Okay, me too. I'm past live. <laughs> okay, we're live again. I didn't remind you this morning. Remember, you're on TV, so smile. smile you know, <laughs> be nice. Uh, don't do odd things that all your constituents and all your neighbors will see. So with that, uh, we will move on into some of the heavy work now for the committee. Um, and we'll start talking about the, the class six permitting and fee schedule. Um, I was talking to, to OSLI Director Scoggins here before we started. And some of the questions we've had, um, Director and her staff will be able to answer some of those because they've already issued a lease for poor space. So um, they've kind of uh, went out ahead of everybody, uh, made a decision, followed it, which is great. Don't get me wrong. I think somebody making a decision and going forward is great. We have a starting place. So, so with that, director and your staff. Oh, one thing before you get started, uh, not to uh, shade Ms. Barkhouse's appointment, but we also had uh, Representative Heiner, Senator Ellis appointed to the um council on environmental quality so the white house council i, I wonder if they're gonna change their affiliation <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations to all of you to represent wyoming because this is an important issue for the state and that and it's great to have that that input into those organizations that group so with that director please start uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next topic that we're going to cover are uh, the fees and uh, financial assurance associated with Class 6 permits and uh, and then have a, a discussion about the things that aren't currently covered by fees and are covered by general funds uh, so we can have that discussion. And I'm going to turn that over to uh, Administrator Sigmund to uh, do that conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Again, my name is Jennifer Zygmunt. I'm the Water Quality Division Proceed. Administrator. Thank you. Uh, so uh, just some opening remarks as I get into the presentation. Uh, so again, I just wanna start with clarifying that the fees that we're discussing today only apply to class six permits that are authorized by the DEQ. We're not talking about class two announced oil recovery permits um, with this presentation. And, and frankly, we're bringing forth an idea for the committee's consideration. Um, I will go over what fees the program currently has. I'll touch on how the program as is administered. And then I'll uh, present the recommendation for your consideration today about an additional fee that uh, the committee might wish to consider. So um, getting on to slide number three, our current funding process. Uh, so statutes, current statutes authorize the department to institute two fees um, for class six permits. Uh, the first is under 3511-313-H, and this is the permit application fees. Uh, this directs the DEQ uh, to administer an application fee for all class six applications. Uh, we do that through the pre-application uh, meeting that you heard uh, Ms. Barkow talk about. Uh, when we meet with the applicant, we get information about the project, and then we put together a cost estimate, a very detailed cost estimate that we then provide to the applicant, uh, letting them know how much we think it will take for the DEQ to issue the Class 6 permit. Uh, the applicant then needs to provide a check with their application for that amount, and receiving the application uh, with the check together starts the 60-day clock for our review. The cost for reviewing an application and issuing a permit will vary, again, depending on the size of the project, uh, the complexity of the project, uh, how complete and uh, thorough the application is. Um, but we have seen costs from $17,000 to $21,000 so far for the applications that we currently have in-house. Um, just for a quick comparison, uh, North Dakota, the other state with primacy, does something similar with the cost estimate. We would say that their uh, application fees have been in the same ballpark around $10,000 up to $20,000. Louisiana, as a comparison, it, they are still working to propose their final rules, uh, so this is still to be determined. 
um, but they're proposing a much higher application fee, a minimum of, of $125,000. $100,000 of that would be for the facility plus $25,000 per well. Um, so quite a difference across the three states um, that either have primacy or are seeking primacy. So so Ms. Zygma, I, Mr. Chairman. I assume that later on your presentation, you'll make some recommendations. Okay. Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Please proceed. The second fee that the DEQ has authority to institute, and again, this is not a new fee, this is in statute, uh, would be an injection fee that provides funds into the special revenue account that's used uh, for long-term management of the site. After the class six permit is over, uh, the site has been closed, they've met all site closure requirements, a uh, title and transfer uh, of liability has gone to the state for the statutes passed last year. Um, this injection fee would fund the special revenue account so that the state has funds to do the monitoring of management and verification activities during that post-closure long-term stewardship phase. Uh, so again, this is not a new fee. It was authorized in statute. And then the DEQ had the flexibility to establish what that fee would be in rule. We did that in 2022. Uh, we promulgated chapter 29 of the water quality rules and that established that injection fee at seven cents per ton. So uh, kind of as you think about numbers, uh, the way to look at it is for every million tons injected, this would result in $70,000 put into the special revenue account. Funds are put into the special revenue account where they accumulate interest, but again, they are only used for monitoring and management of activities during that long-term stewardship phase. The, the feedback that we got when promulgating chapter 29 consistently, the question that we got was, was seven cents enough? Uh, we think it is. Um, if we take a theoretical project, say a, a project injects a million tons per year over 20 years, that would result in $1.4 million in the special revenue account uh, after site closure. That would in include interest earned um, into the special revenue account, again, for funds for the state to use for those activities. We, it, it's, it's difficult to project um, because these funds won't be used until um, quite a few quite a while into the future. If a company started injecting today, injected for 20 years, we then have a minimum period of 20 years um, for site closure requirements to be met, maybe more. So in theory, we're looking at around 2063 when those funds would come into use. Um, we've been asked about inflation and whether or not that seven cents per ton is sufficient to cover inflation costs. Uh, we do think it is. Um, we always have the ability to increase that amount through rulemaking if uh, we choose to. We also have the ability at the time a project is closed to ask for additional funds based on a site closure estimate if we don't think we have sufficient funds in the special revenue account for the state to do its job. Okay. Ms. Zygmunt, a question just for clarification. So company injects for 20 years and they say we're done. That doesn't mean they get to walk away at that point. So because the department has to sign off on everything. So say there are issues and the department by the time they get them resolved you have another 10 years in there so you have that that gap of of 20 years where injections stop and then 10 years where the state finally takes over ownership in that are you getting any fee in that period of time for the for the injected co2 or is it just hanging Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. So uh, the injection fee that we're, we're talking about right now is only during that time when carbon dioxide is injected. So it would not cover uh, the period after injection cease and the applicant is working toward site closure. So we do not have a fee to cover that time period. And then that will tie into later in the conversation. I, I guess that then leads to my next question is, should we have a fee to cover that period? Because it, there'll be other things going on other than just strictly monitoring. You're going to have to do inspections on the company, figure out why you couldn't get the closure, they couldn't get the closure. And that uh, is that something we would need to consider, do you think? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that is what we are uh, proposing for okay. the committee's consideration. And I'll have a slide here shortly that okay. will outline Thank you. the process and where we do and don't have fees. It D didn't mean to jump ahead. On That's okay. That. Thank you for the question. Please proceed. Thank you. 
Uh, so again, uh, the, the feedback that we heard when promulgating chapter 29 is seven cents enough. We do think it is, again, with the ability to ask for additional funds based on a project specific closure estimate uh, when, the, when the project is ready to apply for site closure. Um, just for a quick comparison, again, North Dakota has also instituted the seven cents per ton injection fee. Uh, Louisiana is also proposing a tonnage fee Fee, um, but that calculates out to uh, $5 million paid over a 12-year period. Um, they're using a, a, a more complex formula, um, but it, they're looking for roughly $5 million into their special revenue account or the equivalent thereof in, in their state. The, the main point of this slide, slide number five for financial assurance, is just to make the point that the fees that we're talking about are separate from the financial assurance that a permittee has to carry during all the operational phases of the permit. Once they start land disturbing activities, financial assurance has to be carried as part of the permit requirements. Uh, the fees are in addition to, to financial assurance. The financial assurance covers risk to the state if a company walked away from the project during its operation, and that's separate from the fees that we're talking about for the application fee and the injection fee and the fees that we're, we are here to propose for the committee's consideration. So, Ms. Zygmunt, a question on that. In the statutes, it also requires them to, if I remember correctly, to have insurance, and it's not listed here. Are the companies going to have any problem getting insurance from a, if it says insurance, I assume it's an insurance company that they have to go out and, and get a policy from. Mr. Chairman, you are correct. If financial assurance is separate from the insurance requirements that they have to carry, and I might have to put Ms. Burkow on the spot to speak more to the insurance requirement. Ms. Burkow? Mr. Chairman, uh, they would be required to carry the liability insurance uh, associated with the risks identified in the back of uh, Chapter 24 or Appendix A um, of our water quality rules. Uh, those are the typical insurance uh, associated with liability, um, trespass, acts of God, um, um, groundwater trespass, and uh, mineral trespass. Um, they should be able to apply for those. Um, have not heard of any issues in industry of them acquiring that in insurance. Okay. So, and a follow-up question to those, Ms. Zygmunt. You mentioned a company that goes out of business. They've been injecting for 15 years. One day they just don't exist anymore. They've packed up and left. And that so now is the state stuck with that well? And that and how are we gonna pay to do the final completion on it before we end up taking ownership? They've paid their money up to that point, but all of a sudden they just decide, well, easy way out of this is just disappear. I mean, we had that problem with uh um coal bed methane wells where we had innumerable abandoned wells that we couldn't even find owners for so just or do you re address that later on also uh, mr chairman I, I i don't have any further slides on that topic but again that points back to the reason for the financial assurance which is uh, to have those bonds in place so that if that does happen uh, we have the state has funds to uh, remediate the well plug and abandon the well uh, make sure that site is closed as you can see on the slide, we estimate that that financial assurance could be upwards of 35 to $50 million, again, just depending on the project. Um, that financial assurance can also be phased in terms of, you know, at the beginning of the project when they're just drilling a well, they'll need financial assurance for the well construction. As they get into injection, that financial assurance is going to go up as they start closing the site, cease injection, and then they're, they're in the post-injection phase, that financial assurance will, will go down again. So it'll go up and down uh, during the course of the project. But again, the purpose of the financial assurance is to make sure the state has funds to remediate the site if the company. Um... So with financial insurance, then uh, that would be in the form of a bond payable to the state? Mr. Chairman, that is correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Please, please Mr. proceed. Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Rothfuss. Thank you. Very brief briefly on that topic. Um, as we're developing this, it, it might not be a bad idea to contemplate the trust approach that we are using uh, for coal, for example, as opposed to um, this traditional approach. And it, I, I don't know how challenging it would be to put together that legislation, but Mr. Chairman, that, that might be something that uh, we can get ahead on this and, and just sort of do it that way from the beginning. 
And it would make a lot of sense to be building up, as you suggest, where there's certain sureties as targets along the path. And then the other benefit of that is that that fund then could actually be uh, dedicated over towards the long-term um, monitoring fund. Potentially, there might be a way to have a financial arrangement there so that it would be financially beneficial then for both the state and the operator uh, to, instead of having expenditures along the way, actually having a residual savings account that, that could be looked to both for surety and then for uh, long-term surety. Uh, that the state could look to. So it might be even more advantageous here than than what we've seen in the past. And I don't know if we've had those discussions internally or not, but it's something that I think the committee should look at. Mr. Chairman, Senator Rothfuss, thank you for the suggestion. That is something that, you know, we, we, we talk about broadly between the divisions about the different bonding mechanisms and the best way to approach it. Um, for other UIC classes of wells that require bonding, we've had this conversation. I believe there might be some federal regulations that limit the bonding mechanisms that can be applied for, for UIC wells. But I, I do appreciate the suggestion and we can look into that further. S Senator, for the new committee members, could you give them just a, a one or two minute explanation of what you were talking about? A lot of them are not familiar with what we did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and could probably have others correct me if I if I stray, but um, I think it was two years ago, we passed legislation that provided the opportunity for, uh, and I think we ended up limiting it just to surface coal. Is that accurate or did we end up broadening it beyond that for the first round? Director? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, it was for coal, trona, bentonite, and uranium. Okay. We, so, Mr. Chairman, we, we provided the opportunity instead of having external bonding requirements uh, for the state to establish trusts wherein these operators could invest resources into that trust, which would then be interest bearing. And that could be as a complement to the existing surety. So the surety total would have to remain the same. Whatever the bonding requirement was, was going to stay the bonding requirement. But it would then be shifting from uh, that liability to actually having an asset that would uh, protect that. And then once all remediation was completed, uh, any remaining funds would then be released. So it, it does become an asset at that point. And it's a it's a great win-win because the state of Wyoming then has uh, greater surety since we are the holder of those funds. Um, those are ours in the event of a bankruptcy, uh, which is a great resource, right? We don't get tied up in bankruptcy court if, if there are challenges there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there is then interest in, in the... Uh, operator utilizing those because it's a lower cost to them, as well as the possibility of, of getting the funds back on the backside if there's any remaining. So uh, great piece of legislation, and we're hoping to see that widely used in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank Please you. proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so we'll go ahead and go on to the next slide, uh, which just kind of ties it all together for what we've talked about so far, which is a very uh, brief version of the flow chart that Ms. Barkow talked about in the last presentation, uh, the permitting process for class six wells. Uh, takeaway here is that the boxes in uh, gray are covered currently through uh, state general funds uh, to support uh, staffing and other costs associated with those activities. Uh, the boxes in blue are the steps in the permitting process that are covered with the application fees. And then the box on the end there uh, in purple uh, represents the activities that are covered by the long-term stewardship injection fee, the seven cents per ton uh, that we just talked about. Um, so the, the three steps that we are most concerned about today in terms of our recommendation for the committee's consideration would be the operation, the post-injection site care, and the closure boxes shown in gray there. Um, these are the steps after a permit is issued um, where for oversight activities in order to meet our primacy requirements, uh, staffing is still needed to do activities such as inspections, reviewing data, uh, submitting monitoring reports, make sure we're reporting to uh, EPA. Again, doing all of the normal oversight activities that we would do for a primacy program to make sure that these uh, facilities are operating according to their permit and that we are protecting water quality. Um, so it's not just issuing the permit. Again, we have work to do after that. So what we are proposing to the committee um, for consideration is whether a fee should be considered uh, to support um, activities during those three phases. 
we have looked at staffing costs for um, those activities. Um, we roughly estimate that per project, it would be 10% of one FTE um, for each permit to conduct these activities. Um, again, roughly estimating what those costs would be, we're looking at anywhere between 15 to $20,000 per year, again, per, per permit. Uh, going on to the next slide, um, before we circle back to the recommendation, I do just want to touch on federal funding for the UIC program um, so that you're aware of what federal resources there are. We do receive some limited federal funding for class one and five wells, not a lot. It's, it's, it's only about $170,000 per year to support staffing costs with those wells. We do not at this time uh, anticipate any federal funding will be uh, provided for UIC class six wells. Um, that's not been a topic of national discussion. Uh, and so at this point, we're not anticipating that that, that is an option on the table. Uh, the 2021 IIJA bill did provide um, a $50 million grant for states either with primacy or seeking primacy to support um, those states implementing and developing primacy programs. We have submitted a letter of interest for that grant. We're still waiting to hear um, how funding will be allocated amongst, I believe, the 25, 26 states or tribes that uh, put in a letter of interest. Um, but we I do want to emphasize that even if we do get this funding, it will be one-time funding, and we are watching that bill closely to understand what strings would be attached to, to that grant, and that's something that we'll need to consider before we accept the funding, again, if we are offered funding under that grant. Moving on to the next slide, slide number eight. Again, just a table to kind of uh, bring it together as we look at what the other states with primacy or seeking primacy are doing. Again, a big part of what uh, Lily has done. She keeps track of national conversations, uh, talks with the other states seeking primacy to understand you know, how they're implementing their programs, administering their programs, what fees that they're charging. So as you can see in the table, all three states, North Dakota, Louisiana, and Wyoming charge the application fees we talked about. All three states charge that long-term stewardship fee based on an injection per ton rate. Um, Wyoming currently is the only state that does not charge that administrative or annual fee um, for the steps after um, application issuance. Moving on to slide nine, uh, real quickly on our program administration. Of Representative Conrad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question to follow up. You mentioned one tenth FTE per application is what you envision right now, Ms. Sigma. Correct. 10% of an FTE would be needed to do those uh, oversight activities per permit. Per permit. Per permit. No follow-up question, Mr. Chairman. Please. How do our fees compare to North Dakota and Louisiana as respective to slide eight? Mr. Chairman. No segment. To review what the other states are doing, it's, it's a great question. So starting with the application fee, again, North Dakota and Wyoming are doing something very similar. We have a cost estimate that we provide to the applicant. Um, North Dakota's have been have been in the range of ten to twenty thousand um, dollars. Ours have been in the range of seventeen to twenty thousand dollars. Louisiana, for their application fee, is charging one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars minimum, and it could be more depending on how many wells are associated with each facility. For the administrative fee, uh, North Dakota charges a one cent per ton injection fee um, for it in. For agricultural energy sectors, if it's a different sector, uh, they will have a hearing to set that injection fee. Um, it roughly translates out to, again, if, if a project implemented 2 million tons per year at 1 cent per ton, that would be about $20,000 per year, just, just to, to provide some context there. Uh, Louisiana, for their injection fee, again, they have a more complex formula to calculate that out, but it will result in $5 million at the end of the project, and they calculate that over a 12-year 12 12 time period to come up with the uh, cent per ton injection fee that they will charge. And then for the long-term stewardship fee, both, both North Dakota and Wyoming have instituted the seven cents per ton. Um, Louisiana, for their injection fee, is, um, I apologize, uh, Mr. Chairman's uh, Representative Conrad, let me clarify that. So Louisiana for the injection fee is their, their long-term stewardship fee. That's where they have $5 million paid over a 12-year period to, to calculate their, um, their per, per ton injection fee. 
uh, the answer that I should have given you for Louisiana's administrative fee is that they are charging a flat fee of $50,000 per year for each facility. Thank you. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so slide nine, again, just touching briefly on our program administration. Uh, currently, we have two and a half FTE uh, dedicated to the program. That includes the, the one FTE um, that we received uh, last session, again, which we're very grateful for. Um, the other one and a half FTE are a mix of existing staff, including Ms. Barkow's time as section manager. Um, as was talked about previously, we're continuing to monitor workloads and staffing needs. Uh, we uh, will be considering whether we need to request additional resources to make sure that we keep up with the application demand. Um, as you heard this morning, we, we currently have five applications in-house. We anticipate up to 20 permit applications for 2023 by the end of this year, and then tentatively another 40 permit applications over the next two to four years. Um, so we do want to ramp up our program thoughtfully. Um, we want to make sure that we have, obviously, enough staff to process permit applications uh, timely and efficiently, uh, but we need to do that in a way um, that we're, we're, we're thoughtfully adding staff as, as the need arises. Um, for a quick comparison with the other states, North Dakota has two to three FTEs. Louisiana is starting with around seven FTEs. So on to slide 10. Um, to come back to a recommendation, again, we are considering, or we are requesting that the committee consider an additional fee for class six wells, which would be that annual administrative fee to cover activities after permit issuance. We would recommend if the committee chooses to pursue that, that we do that through establishment of the flat fee that would be based on an annual cost estimate that we provide to the permittee. Again, we roughly estimate that that would be about fifteen dollars to $20,000, representing that 10% of an FTE's time to do those duties. Um, to make that recommendation, um, we would first need proposed legislation. Um, currently, the statutes do not authorize us to implement this fee. So again, if the committee chooses to pursue this, um, the statutes would need to be revised. Uh, this slide shows some proposed language as a starting point, again, if the committee, ch committee chooses to pursue this. Um, I will make the point here, though, that you know uh, the program will operate either way. If the committee sees fit to pursue a fee, um, that would help give us options uh, to make sure that we can staff the program ap appropriately, um, meet primacy requirements, uh, depending on how the the state of the general fund budget is looking. I, you know, we've had ups and downs. Uh, having a fee would help alleviate some of the um, budget cuts that we've seen in the past. Um, but again, we're not attached to whether or not the fee is instituted. I'm just putting it out there for your, your consideration. Um, so we would need statutes to authorize the fee. Um, last slide there, slide number 12. Um, we would work out details just like we did for the injection fee through rulemaking. And we propose doing that by modifying our water quality rules, chapter 29, uh, to establish how we would institute that annual fee again if, if the committee chooses to pursue that. Um, so with that, uh, that concludes my presentation, and I would stand for questions. Mr. Co-Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> Good presentation. I'm trying to recall back in the session, at some point, another office in the building asked me to add some money to the budget for these additional positions as they came available. What, I can't recall. Did we end up adding anything, or you still need that done for these positions as we prepped this whole program and make it viable in the state? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I apologize. I, I couldn't quite hear part of that question. Yeah, so at one point, we were asked by another place in the building, add some money to budget for these positions. Did that happen? I can't remember. I remember working on something. I just don't recall the final outcome upstairs in the appropriations room. Mr. Chairman, I, I think I understand the question. So we did request an additional FTE devoted to Class 6 permitting with this last session, and we did receive that position, and we have since filled it. Thank you. Mr. Co-Chair, are you going to take it from here, or do you want me to finish this one? Finish this one. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just curious on just kind of comparison. I know that the WOGCC also regulates, and I think they have a fee structure in place for their Class two wells. And so I'm curious if you're anticipating this to be similar to that. And I guess maybe this is a question for our supervisor. I don't know how that fee structure works. So if we could just kind of compare what you're proposing with what exists in that realm, that would be helpful. 
Ms. Zygman, uh, Director Kropach. Okay, whoever wants to take this one, don't uh, fight over it. Mr. Chairman, I'll have to defer to uh, Supervisor Kropach to answer that question. Mr. Chairman, uh, we do at the Oil and Gas Commission have a fee for Class Two wells. We charge seventy-five dollars per year per Class Two well. There's roughly four thousand five hundred Class Two wells in the state right now, um, so that brings in about three hundred and thirty thousand dollars, or a little more than that, every year, and that covers the cost for the commission staff to do all the inspections um, and other work that's required of the program. And then we also get a small grant, about $150,000 a year from EPA. And so the fee covers what it costs the agency on top of the EPA grant. Any, anyone else on that one? Ms. Sigma? Mr. Chairman, just to, to help make sure we fully answer the question, um, what we are contemplating here today is solely for DEQ and Class 6 permits. Okay. Representative Heiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I see one of the proposals for legislation is to have that fee determined by the director. With the other fees that the uh, DEQ ad, uh, administers, are those all uh, determined by the director or are some of them set by statute? Uh, director, Ms. Zygmunt. Oh, yeah. the, I think he's talking about the seven cents and then the upfront, the permit. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have a variety of programs that have a fee assessment. Uh, in some instances, it's set by the director based on what the estimated costs are going to be for the coming year. And then we reconcile with the uh, with the companies at the end of the year when we get prepared to send out the next invoice uh, for for the fees. That, that would be one example. Another example uh, would be uh, similar to the industrial siting division, where we uh, assess a fee, which we calculate after we do a jurisdictional meeting with the company, we'll assess a fee to process that application. Uh, and then uh, any time that we are expending outside of something that's being permitted, it charges to the general fund. So we do a kind of a combination there, but those are set uh, again, by the director or the staff, will make a recommendation on the uh, on the fee for the project. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Ms. Sigma? Mr. Chairman, if I could just add to that. So what we are contemplating here would be a fee structure similar to what the industrial siting uh, division currently does for their fees, which the general funds would be allocated up front. Uh, we would bill to the projects on an annual basis based on that cost estimate to recover general fund costs. Any general fund not spent by the end of the year would be reverted. So I do just want to clarify that that would be the best mechanism to use in order to make sure that we can uh, maintain a consistent staffing workload. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other questions. Oh, uh, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm sorry, and I'm just kind of reading through these slides. You know, the permit application fee you said ranges between 17,000 to 21,000. And then just talking about the tonnage cost for storage. And then I, I think I've missed the number. I've forgotten it already. Comparing that $75 per well um, from the class two side, what would, what is your thinking on a dollar amount for this fee? Is it not? Mr. Chairman, so, you know, we would, that fee would be based on a cost estimate that would be largely project specific. So on an annual basis, we would take a look at the project and, and determine um, specifically how much staff time would be needed for the year to do those oversight activities. But as we've contemplated this, we've roughly estimated that to be 10% of an FTE um, so fifteen thousand to twenty thousand dollars per year. Other questions? Okay, with that, and because at this point we are discussing potential legislation, uh, I will open this up to public comment. Anyone here wish to speak on this? Mr. Obermiller. Anyone online? Okay. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
And uh, before I go, Mr. Chairman, let me just say how much I appreciated that uh, the Chamber of Commerce here provided lunch for everybody in the room. I, I've been around a long time. That doesn't happen very often. Usually they send neon wash masses out on the street and you guys get to eat. That was just really great. So I'm... You got you to gotta know the right people. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very, <laughs> very impressed and very thankful for that. Um, Mr. Chairman, appreciate the discussion. And um, as as written, POW would oppose the the fee as it's written uh, and proposed by DEQ. And let me just talk about it in a couple for a couple of instances. Um, let me just clarify that we're, we're not opposed to the idea that uh, uh, you know, sort of a user fee that the the people who need the activity at the agency um, would pay would would be the ones who would pay for the activity that happens in almost every agency uh, uh, it, it, across industries, not just our industry. And you heard the class two question from Senator Ellis, which is really very helpful. Um, the issue is more about the uh, the discretion and the, sort of the lack of sideboards attached to this language that we don't know what it would be and uh, nobody knows what it would be. Uh, estimating that it's 10% of an FTE uh, over the uh, uh, for each application, fifteen to uh, fifteen thousand dollars or more, um, we don't know whether that's the true cost, and we won't know whether that's the true cost until we have some time to do it. And when we look at the other states and and what they have proposed, there there it is a shot in the dark from both of those states. Um, the Louisiana one is shockingly high. The North Dakota one is shockingly subjective. One uh, percent or a one cent per ton fee uh, if it has an economic benefit to the state. Otherwise, it's a per case by case basis and a hearing. The, 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 I'm not sure that there are, that either one of those are ones that we should follow. And I would argue that we, uh, that we take a little pause here on this and let the applications develop and see how this works over time. Now, let me add one more thing to that. Um, as Ms. Zygmunt pointed out, whether or not you have a fee doesn't mean that they're not going to do the work. Well, where does the money come from to do the work if you don't have a fee? It comes from the general fund. Um, the general fund and the budget reserve account that feeds the general fund is almost, in, is I shouldn't say almost entirely, is largely funded by the oil and gas industry. Nearly $760 million in FY23 went into the general fund and the budget reserve account from oil and gas. Um, the only one, the only other source uh, of which oil and gas paid 25 million of is sales and use tax, but the rest of it is severance tax and federal mineral royalties that feed the general fund and the budget reserve account. So we are already paying for it. Uh, the, so the question is, and 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 the why the reason why the class two fee works is we already pay for the, for the oil and gas commission as well. The oil and gas industry pays a conservation tax that funds Supervisor Kropatch's entire agency. Uh, and But not everybody does class two injection. Some companies do a lot more class two injection. So a $75 per, per well uh, for, for folks that do class two makes some sense because they have a little bit more skin in the game because they're the ones that do it. So there's, th there's an argument to be made there. This, uh, this goes too far, is too discretionary. And if we follow the other states, uh, uh, I would argue is much higher than is necessary to operate the program, program that we're going to end up paying for anyway, because we fund the general fund. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would ask that we just pause on, I would ask you that we pause on this and let some time elapse till we know a little bit more about what, to, what, what we could ask for and what would be reasonable in terms of a fee. Questions? Uh, Representative Roth. I'm sorry, Senator Roth. That's all right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Pete, I... I'm a little curious about the the interest in not going this route because of the argument that you said, where uh, effectively general fund is covered greater than fifty percent by oil and gas at well, a lot of the time, and uh, but not all class six wells will necessarily uh, be for oil and gas projects. I, I mean, I I think many of them will. Uh, in the near future, but I, I think the intent here is to have funding that's project specific uh, so that it isn't just oil and gas that, that's effectively paying for it and that you're paying for it on a, on a user basis. Um, 
so while the language might not be perfect here, I think the intent is actually consistent with your intent. And I'm, I'm wondering if we should push pause or whether we should just spend a little bit more time on the language and try to get it to the point where it uh, meets the common interest of appropriately reflecting a value that is, is judiciously um, proposed, but also getting it off of the general fund so that it's paid as a user fee, which I think is in everybody's interest. What are your thoughts? Mr. Obermuller? Mr. Chairman, Senator Office. Yeah, perhaps it's semantics, though I do think a pause is in order because the argument that an administrative fee requires fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per year per facility, even if you take the DEQ's own estimate of total applications over the next few years, 65, 65 potential applications over the next few years, fifteen to twenty thousand per year from each one. That's that that's that's more than to me, that seems like it's more than is necessary, but we don't have the data to know. So there's that part of it. But to your point, Senator Office, and it's fair enough, if, 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 if I'm, I'm always interested in sort of this legal language that, uh, you know, when 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 uh, attorneys ask the court, they say, we'd like you to dismiss the case. But if not, then we'll ask you to do X. But if not, then we'll ask you to do Y. So we, we'd like you to dismiss the case. But if not, here, here's a couple of suggestions. Number one, I appreciate that the director says that that what they'll do is they'll do this by rule, but that's not what the language proposed says. They say it says is the, the the fee is determined by the director. At a minimum, it needs to be determined by rule, uh, not by not by just an assessment by the director. Uh, second, um, why, if the purpose of the fee is to fund the pre-closure ongoing operations based on cost, why would you have an account that earns interest and goes into the account? It's supposed to it's supposed to pay for the expense. It's not it's not supposed to build a fund that earns interest. So to your point, Senator Rothfuss, on the post-closure fee, the trust idea, that th there's some sense to an, an interest-bearing account there but not on a fee that is supposed to fund the ongoing operations. So, uh, so I, you know, if, if, if the idea is that there's going to be an interest bearing account and enough money to have an interest bearing account, then perhaps the 15 to 20 K is too high. Follow up. But I, I honestly read the last language as standard language based on float and the fact that in any account that exists in the legislative, legislatively creative, created, excuse me, um, it ends up with interest, just uh, whether it's an agency pool, it's still getting 2.1%. So where does that interest go? Does it get swept? You wouldn't want it swept because it belongs to uh, the program. And I, I think, I mean, that's what I read it as. It, you put that there so that it doesn't get swept by JAC, which to me seems like it would be uh, an even worse outcome from industry. The money should be spent on the intended objective instead of going to the general fund. And that's that's the way I read the sentence. But um, getting back to the specific fees, I, I, I do agree. And I, the intent as I read it is that the fee is based on anticipated expenses incurred by the, the department. So it, it is supposed to be how much is it going to cost us divided by number of permits equals uh, fee. That was the way I read it. But how, how would we phrase that in a way that better captures uh, that interest of just hitting the actual as opposed to um, speculating? Mr. Obermuller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Rothfuss, yeah, I mean, the, both of your, your comments sort of are related in that what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that we think about it a little bit differently than the typical language where we're building this fund in order to run a program. Uh, we should, at a minimum, I think we should look at it as what were the costs and let's reimburse those costs so that the fee is tied to the cost that we're not building up a fund for a program that needs interest. So that's what I, that, so, so the language would be, would be backward looking, not, not forward looking if we're going to do a fee. And that is essentially, that's the way that OGCC operates not just for this, but but for uh, uh, all of their programs because they're self-funded. They can look at what their programs cost, and they're in constant dialogue with industry about here's what it costs, here's what we need, here's what we can do to fluctuate because of that. But it's it, it is in some ways backward looking, and that's that's what I'm suggesting. 
Okay, Thank Representative Lawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Obermuller, um, I think that the term of legal art, which I'll defend here is alternatively. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I, I wanna make sure I'm understanding you, and you made some really good points by the way, but um, alternatively, you would uh, agree that perhaps maybe some minimum kind of administrative fee might be acceptable while we wait out and see, we, we have more evidence of what's actually needed. I mean, do you admit that there's gonna be some cost to the, the, the department to, and, I mean, I'm just wondering where you stand on that. I kind of wonder, understand your uh, what if argument or uh, alternative argument. Mr. Obermiller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Lawley, um, is there going to be a cost to the agency to have staff and, and to have the staff work in an office, et cetera? Of course. Um, but state agencies exist by and for the state, and we have a mechanism to fund those agencies via the general fund. Uh, so fees are a way for the legislature, quite frankly, and our, my friends at JAC to move dollars off of the general fund so you can spend oil and gas money on other projects. Uh, just to be as direct as I can about it. So quite, so, so my, my preference is that we don't do a fee in part because we'll get to it a little bit later, but um, that we, 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 we leave it lie because we have this window in Wyoming to establish ourselves as the leader the leader in this in this area and um let's let's climb through that window before we start doing these things so that's why i don't you know we already have we've got the seven cents we've got the application fee uh and, and all of that let's let's move forward with that let's let the general fund cover their ongoing costs like the general fund is supposed to do for all agencies uh and uh, and go forward from there okay if your Honor, if the court decides that that's not appropriate, huh. then let's put some sideboards. Let's make sure it's by rule. Let's uh, let's have it be directly tied to costs uh, and that sort of thing. Representative Larson. Oh, did you have a follow-up, Representative Lawley? Please. If you would just, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would you help me understand how you, you connected the progress of this program and of what we want to do, which I I really understand, and again, it's a very good point. But are are you saying that you feel like that this fee in some way will inhibit that? Because that's what I heard. Is that what you feel? And can you help me understand that a little better, Mr. Obermill? Mr. Chairman, Representative Lolly, I can't tell you that on a per project basis. What I can tell you is that the economics of carbon sequestration are thin. And uh, and particularly not knowing what the fee is going to be prior to a project is especially difficult. Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this might be a question for Director Parfit, but um, what is the uh, annual cost per employee for this program? Mm -hmm. Uh, so Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but it would be somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, when you look at the direct and indirect costs, 150 to 180 thousand for a position okay. annually. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Rep Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this is for Director Parfit. I mean, is your concern to some degree that the legislature is just not going to fund your positions? As if we get this industry and this program going. Um, is that the what we're not saying out loud that we're all thinking? Director, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Ellis. Uh, yeah, in in part, uh, if you look back in the last few years, we went through some very difficult uh, budget times, and we had to make some difficult decisions on making reductions uh, to staff and to uh, funding for different programs. And so I wouldn't say it's entirely there, but uh, that's something to certainly uh, bring out in the discussion is that we don't want to do anything that would jeopardize our, our uh, resources to implement the program and give EPA some kind of a, a reason to come in and uh, change our primacy agreement. Senator Rothfuss. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just to weigh in on that, you know, I've, I've watched this for over a dozen years now, and, and this committee has put together good programs to help facilitate industry. And then 
chronically we've understaffed and under-resourced Department of Environmental Quality to implement them at various times. And then they've had to go in through the budget and fight for positions. Industry has supported that fight and we've ended up getting them. But what that has led to time and again is uh, periods of time when we've had insufficient capacity to actually get permits across the finish line, not because we don't have good regulations, not because we don't have willing partners, but honestly, because we just don't have the humans to do the work. So it, it is a, a valid concern where when we're on general fund alone, uh, we are at the whim of the Appropriations Committee to decide how many people we need in land quality, how many people we need in water quality and air quality at any given time. And they don't dig in as much as this committee does. They don't spend as much time hearing this and they don't understand how valuable these positions are to industry and to economic development and production in the state of Wyoming. Um, so in, in my view, there has traditionally been good reason for us to find approaches like OGCC has where they're internally funded. Uh, we have other divisions that, that use fees to support them, but um, this might not be a perfect fee, but there's good justification in looking to fees as a means of ensuring that we don't just have the Appropriations Committee cutting and leading to millions of dollars of lost revenue for the state to save one FTE. Wouldn't you agree? If anyone wants to agree, feel free. <laughs> I think there was a question in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Lawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, back to your alternative argument about something. It, that what, what if that something looked like a set minimum fee? So uh, again, maybe set somewhat low the bar, but a set specific administrative fee uh, assessed a, you know annually. I, again, I know we don't know the number. I know that might matter, but on the alternative, uh, what would your response be to that, Mr. Obermuller? Mr. Obermuller. Mr. Chairman, Representative Lawley. Well, I I like the class two fee. Se 75. <laughs> I mean, you laugh, but I'm only partly joking. I mean, what, what, how, a class two injection at $75 per well. So a company like Merit in the Bighorn Basin that does a lot of class two injection ends up paying for most of that program, but they do most of that work, but they pay for the program at $75. I, I'm a, at a little bit of a loss why class two works at 75, but class six needs 20,000. <laughs> Senator office. Yeah. I, I think there's a good reason for that uh, in, in that they're going to be very different and, and the, the whole program surrounding them is very different. But getting back to the idea of, of just looking at actuals, which is the concept, um, if, if you have an actual cost associated with the program, um, delivering that cost and passing it on directly seems like it wouldn't be objectionable. Is that fair? After the fact, actuals. Mr. Obermuller? Mr. Chairman, be, be happy to look at that. Okay. Other questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Obermuller. Any other public comment? Mr. Chairman, we do have someone online. Okay. Um, local, are they registered? If they're not registered, they don't get to speak. They're they're registered, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Go ahead. Whoever. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Oh, I don't yeah. Yes, proceed. Mr. Chairman, uh, Pat Sweeney uh, from Casper, uh, representing myself, uh, not an industry partner. Um, I just would like to say ditto to what Mr. Obermuller just stated. Um, I really think this is a burgeoning uh, market, although it's been around, now what we're talking about is something entirely a, a, a new field. And if we are going to attract 
and be the world leader um, I think we need with uh, to proceed with caution on legislation outlining uh, some of this fee basis. Um, and the only reason which has been stated before um, that this is even possible right now is with the Q45 tax credits. Um, and uh, we don't wanna chase operators off before we've even got started on the races, but just proceed with caution is, is my advice. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Sweeney? Okay, thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Anyone else? All right. Okay, with that, I'll close public testimony. Committee? Mr. Chairman. Senator Office. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. At, at this point, I think we probably should wait. I, I think we have time to give it some more thought. And I I guess I'd ask the, uh, the department to maybe look into what language might look like if we were building on actuals. But at the end of the day, if if this needs to be on general fund for a while, I, I don't see any downside based on the numbers that we have coming ahead of us. Uh, we, we should be able to put the bill um, but I think it's then incumbent upon all of us to make sure that we don't see any cuts to DEQ that would endanger this program. Any other comments? Mr. Coach, Mr. Were you asking for a study, the actuals? What, what, what were you exactly looking for there, Senator? Senator Rothfuss? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, I think the department could try and figure out what an actuals uh, draft language would look like. But honestly, again, I don't know that we need that this year. Uh, as we look to the future, though, um, it's reasonable to look to the OGCC model where they're covering costs through actuals and they have a feedback mechanism to ensure that. I think that's a healthy system and, and a valuable system uh, that we could try to emulate if we need to go to a fee-based system for, for certain portions of DEQ operations. That would be the appropriate model. Uh, but again, we're not talking about necessarily enough FTEs at this point in time. And, and I think another concern here is even if it were actuals, it would be so discontinuous that it would be a little bit challenging uh, based on um, the workflow that you would see over the next several years uh, that the actuals might uh, might hit one company substantially and 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 not be easily blended into uh, to the overall workflow. So at, at this point, I think it's I think it's very reasonable for us to not move forward with the fee. And, and I think the points made by Petroleum Association of, of just keeping ourselves in the best position and continuing to lead in this space, um, it'll be worth a lot more to the state than the cost of the FTE to be the, the clear market leader in CCUS and continue to be in that space. So it's a, it's a massive revenue source for the state of Wyoming in the future. Um, and these fees are trivial compared to what it will represent to the state. Committee, anything else? Representative Lawley? I would generally agree with what Senator Roth has said. I, I think uh, Mr. Obermuller's arguments were persuasive, especially in the, in the first instance. Uh, I do believe that we can't say years into this what the administrative kind of landscape is going to look like. So to wait and see what it looks like in the initial phases, but it could even be very different as we move years down this road. So. Uh, I do think that uh, because of some of the other discussion we've had about um, sometimes things uh, get beyond this committee and it seems that, 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 that there's not the same understanding or interest and in why, why we wanna do what we wanna do is important. So again, that is on us, I appreciate that, but I would agree with the, with the pausing of it and just getting a little data of what are we talking about and um, until then to do it to the general fund. So I agree. Anything else? Any motion from the committee? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Director. I think the decision was is to do nothing at this point in time. So, and with that, I will turn the gavel over to the good co-chair uh, who will take us through the rest of the afternoon. Okay. Capture. Uh, let's keep rolling. Okay. Okay. He's taking a break. I'm taking a break. I'm going.
Oh, these, these people that get weak along the way. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Capture utilization storage technology. Um, for space. Um, no, this one. Interstate. Okay. Just real briefly. All right. We did put the page too fast. Mr. Pro Parfit, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and we will we will be brief on this. But uh, the discussion here is uh, uh, some emerging uh, issues related to uh, pore space considerations, uh, particularly with interstate pore space. Uh, and Ms. Barkow will walk us through that. Go ahead. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the presentation I'm about to provide it's strictly for informational purposes. Uh, from a based on DEQ's perspective of an um, emerging issue regarding poor space. Uh, DEQ is not the lead uh, agency for this topic. As we heard earlier, it is the Oil and Gas Commission. And um, however, this issue uh, does have implications on the Class 6 as in regards to the unitization order uh, that must be in place prior to the issuance of the authorization to inject. So I will go over... Uh, um, just a brief recap of the final class six uh, permit authorization to inject and the connection with two poor space and unitization, uh, various considerations in Wyoming, and then interstate poor space. Uh, this is when a class six area of review, the carbon dioxide plume um, or potential pressure front uh, across the state boundaries. Uh, what, what does that look like uh, for the class six permit? and then a white paper that's currently being developed to discuss this issue. So as mentioned earlier, the DEQ is not able to issue that final class six permit uh, until that uh, unitization order for poor space has been issued. Um, and that occurs through the Wyoming Oil and Gas Commission. Um, so this next figure shows uh, the location of our current class six associated projects. Um, while in the north um, east area, there are those wells um, are currently uh, class one wells as part of the DOE carbon safe project, uh, but they will transition to class six in the future. Um, but we do have uh, class six related projects in the various uh, corners of the states. So course space considerations in Wyoming, uh, the focus lies with private land ownership, uh, state land ownership, federal land ownership, and of course that interstate poor space. So in Wyoming, as you heard earlier, the surface owner is the one that owns the poor space, uh, unless there's other uh, conditions that are there. And these are the areas of, um, these others are the considerations. So interstate poor space, uh, the UIC program does not speak to poor space. Um, EPA considers uh, poor space more of a real estate issue to be addressed between the company and the poor space owner. Uh, class six regulations only require public notice of the draft permit. So we would have to notify uh, counties, um, other states, uh, territories, uh, where the carbon dioxide plume is going to be uh, crossing those boundaries. Um, so again, as mentioned earlier, we cannot issue that final permit until unitization is complete. So how do we proceed if the plume crosses those state um, boundaries? Um, obviously, unitization will be addressed here within the state, but what do we do with uh, the rest of the plume that's in another state? So in collaboration with the School of Energy Resources and the Plain CO2 Reduction Partnership, uh, DU, DEQ is evaluating this interstate poor space issue and the potential impacts that it has in regards to the class six permitting. Um, recommendations to address the issue will be drafted in this white paper, and we hope to complete that uh, within the next three to six months. So this, this concludes our presentation. This is just something we wanted to bring to the uh, committee as a potential issue in the future as something we'll have to, to uh, look closer um, thank, closer at. Thank you. What will the role of the counties be in this once you reach that point? Where, where does the county fit in in the uh, decision-making process? That you're just making them aware, that's it? That's 
Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, it, again, um, the federal UIC program only requires us to notify uh, counties, tribes, and states when the plume is crossing over. Um, but the unitization, um, being it provided that it's within the state uh, boundaries, will be addressed uh, um, from uh, the Oil and Gas Commission. So we'll be notifying the counties or the um, yeah, the counties in regards to the project that's occurring and there's uh, uh, public notice requirements. Um, we do outreach as well um, to, to let them know about the project. So um, plenty of considerations in those aspects for the Thank project. You. Thank you. Committee questions? Questions? Okay, we're good. Anybody else want to testify on this? We're good with this segment then? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a, a question, and I don't know if this is the right time for it, but before we, you know, just thinking about adequate um, staffing to get our CC US, you know, class six program off the ground, um, I would like to make a motion that from it would be a letter from this committee to our friends over the Joint Appropriations Committee, just saying this is an important program for Wyoming. And as you're doing your budget deliberations throughout the year, uh, we want you to know that this is a priority for our state, um, for us to remain leaders in the space. And it would just be encouraging them to fully fund DEQ um, for class six permitting. Okay. Well, sometimes there are friends, but we'll see. How many people are you thinking? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, it would just be a committee to committee letter. Yeah, you don't, don't want to put a number in of positions. And no, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to, We could, if you want to work with the director Parfit on putting a finer point on it, but Essentially, I, I just want to emphasize to our friends on the Joint Appropriations Committee, and I saw this during the last session, we cut a position, and after the fact, all I could think was, well, what if that position actually saves Wyoming money, then we just, you know, right. saved 50, but now we're going to, you know, forego 30,000 in savings, or or just doing the math. So I see, I know that we do that all the time, but just kind of emphasize to them that this is something we've looked at throughout the season. Director Parfit, any opposition to that? Head shake? Okay. Okay, we have a motion moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, name. Didn't ask you for discussion, but I think we're headed in the right direction. Thank you. Brian, you have that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Okay, we're moving on. Carbon capture utilization and storage technology. Supervisor of the Oil and Gas Commission, Rompich. Okay. No. Gone. So, will but Mr. Obermuller handle it? Okay. You get a lot of attention today, sir. Glad we fed you. Good, glad we fed you good lunch. Go ahead. Enchiladas gave me the quick energy I need. So, uh, Mr. Chairman Pete Obermuller, Home Association of Wyoming again. Um, it's on the cause of our lateness currently. Hopefully, I can help accelerate that. Supervisor Crowpatch walked you through this morning with what the current unitization statute looks like, and uh, we would like to suggest some amendments um, to the unitization statutes. So I uh, emailed to you all, and there's also hard copies that I gave to LSO. Um, Mr. Foley, did those get handed out, the, that memo? Okay. There's copies in the back uh, for those of you in the in the audience. So uh, as Supervisor Kropach pointed out, the and, and others have said, our, our unitization statutes and, and sequestration statutes at 35, 11, 313, all the way through 320 uh, have been in place for quite some time, um, over a decade. And uh, as we have um, moved into this sort of newer uh, realm of, of a permanent storage, uh, we've realize that there's uh, some parts of the unitization statute that need to be updated in order to help streamline the process. And I'm excited for this. I, I hope you all know I don't get a lot of joy out of a, being Dr. No. So I like I like actually proposing positive things. And and, and I think this is a positive thing. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through these. Uh, and I won't do a lot of explanation because Supervisor Kropach already did about what currently happens. Uh, but please interrupt with questions. Um, 
So again, the, the, the entire sequestration statute uh, is 3511 313. I'm going to start at 3511 314. And I think you have a memo from me there uh, redlined on what we'd like to do. I'm just going to walk through some of them, uh, particularly the most impactful ones. Uh, so we're at 3511 314, uh, Section A. Mr. Chairman, question. Go ahead. question. So, Mr. Obermuller, last uh, set, no, was it the session before last, 2022. We passed some revisions to all of these sections. Are you dealing with what is currently in statute, or are you dealing with those uh, amendments that will go into effect July first of this year in, a, in six weeks? Go ahead, just to, for clarification, what we're which one we're dealing with, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Co-Chairman. Uh, I'm, I'm dealing with what will be effective uh, July 1, 2023. Thank you for that. Uh, because if this, if if we'd like to ask, um, just spoiler alert, we'd like to ask that that you all ask LSO to put what we've written here into LSO format, uh, and then we can discuss it at your next meeting or the meeting and or the meeting after that. Um, we think this language works, but we're not totally wedded to it. And and after having an opportunity to see it and digest it, others may come to the table with some suggestions about it, uh, and we're open to uh, to suggestions. Uh, so we'll see what language LSO comes up with. Thank you, folks. Okay, go ahead. So, um, first of all, there's uh, several. There's three places, and I, I failed to do one. But uh, uh, Supervisor Kropatch mentioned uh, why it said compliance with environmental requirements. That's before the Class Six program was in place, uh, and so because this deals with unitization for Class Six, uh, um, unitization for uh, geologic storage, geologic sequestration. That in these places we've changed that to underground injection control Class Six well requirements, not just all environmental requirements so that happens in three places and uh that's there on uh in 3511 314 and i've also done that in uh 3511 314 uh romanet 9 um 3511 315 romanet 9 uh, i've changed that there as well i missed one i'm, I'm i regret to say uh in 3511 315 Romanet five, uh, it says with environmental, and that should actually say UIC class six well. So we can work with LSO on that. That's just, uh, that was a drafting error on my part. But essentially the idea is just change that from the general environmental compliance to class six requirements. Okay. Moving down, uh, and I'm gonna jump around here a little bit because these these two things are the most impactful part of what we're suggesting to change. Um, existing statute has that definition of what corresponding rights are. Supervisor Kropatch talked about what corresponding rights are uh, in relation to correlative rights in the production of oil and gas. Uh, it's, this is the, the corresponding part of a unit of uh, sequestration unitization's corresponding rights. Uh, later in the statute, and and Supervisor Kropatch brought up all of these sort of um, difficulties of how to of of what is what of, of defining what or deciding what an economic benefit is. And if you recall what he was saying this morning, which already feels like two days ago, um, he was talking about that that's difficult to do uh, in a number for a number of reasons. Um, but what we've tried to do here is define it. And what I'm going to ask you to do it, it, to think about it, um, it as you think about what economic benefits are is under the existing language, economic benefit is a, a big term. That means what is the economic benefit, the entire writ large for the state, for the economy, et cetera, et cetera. What, what is happening in this project, costs, all that that goes into it, what is the total economic benefit? We're asking you to narrow that focus uh, because we're talking about unitization specifically in this section. What's the economic benefit to unitizing for the poor space owner? And we need to define what it is for the poor space owner so that the poor space owner knows and operators know what they can expect to earn for the uh, for the what the poor space owner can earn for leasing his poor space and what the operator needs to pay for the right to inject. So that's what that's where it changes. So I'm going to jump around here just to because there's a lot of language within our suggestions that tie back to economic benefits. Uh, so. 
you can see right there what it says, equitable proportionate share of the money proceeds due to the various poor space owners in a unit area based on the owner's contribution of poor space storage, which may include injection fees, lease payments, or other considerations. What is that? Those are the payments to poor space owners. Could be um, lease payments, could be injection fees. There could be other things that we're not thinking of. We wanted to be inclusive in this language. We're open to you know suggestions about uh, what could what else could be there. But the idea is to uh, rather is to try to set a, a market, uh, a more of a market rate for what poor space owners are earning, what what defines an economic benefit for poor space owners, so that those that end up that end up not agreeing to be in the unit can get paid in, in a similar fashion. So let me let me advance ahead here. So uh, if you turn to 3511.315, this is the part of the statute where an application has to be submitted. It's a couple of things that are uh, important here. Make sure I'm finding it right. Yeah, so an applicant has to submit in Romanet uh, 7 that the proposed plan determining the quantity of poor space um, uh, assigned to each separately owned track within the unit area and formula or method by which each separately owned track will be allocated the economic benefits generated. So the, again, what their application says to the OGCC is here's how we here's how we propose to make sure that the poor space owners are receiving the economic benefit. The economic benefit is to the poor space owners, not the economic benefit to economy writ large. Okay, so turn then to um, 3511.316, Romanet 6. The method uh, for allocation of economic benefits generated, this is this is what the OGCC is doing after, after the application has been sub submitted. This is what the OGCC has to find in their order. Um, uh, between poor space owners and the unit operator, others is fair and reasonable. What I have struck out there is what Supervisor Kropatch talked a lot about, uh, taking into consideration the cost required to capture, transport, sequester the carbon dioxide. Um, that is, if you're trying to look at a project and see what its general economic benefit is, then you have to reduce the costs. And, and that would require looking at, um, we fear looking at um, uh, private companies' entire operation what their expenses are what their projections are et cetera et cetera to determine what the giant what the what the writ large economic benefit is when what we're trying to do is say the economic benefit is to the poor space owner that's where we're changing it to and so we, we take out that part and you determine the economic benefit based on on injection uh fees not to the agency injection fees paid to the poor space owner uh, lease payments or other considerations, some other arrangement with a private poor space owner that we do not know. And then that second language there, federal injection fees, lease payments, or other considerations shall not be considered for purposes of determination. Um, again, we're, we're open to suggestions that the intent there was to not allow whatever the feds end up requiring of, of companies for, um, for fees for their poor space ownership, that that's not considered in what is the market rate for a private poor space owner. And those of you that were around for um, for the pooling question on, on, um, on the production side, you'll recall that there's some consternation that the feds drive down the price to private landowner. We wanted to get away from that by putting that language in. So let me pause there because that, that, that's the biggest one, and I want to answer Mr. questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Obermuller, looking at, at that section you were just in, seven, and I'm on page three of three, I think maybe it's just a, a matter of semantics, and then going back to page one on economic benefits, economic benefits uh, says, which may include injection fees, lease payments, or other considerations. Now we go over here and say federal injection fees, lease payments, or other considerations shall not be considered for that determination. Is it just a matter of, of wording in there, or am I missing something? Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Co-Chairman, yeah, oh, oh, uh, open to changes in the language. We can certainly, that's why I wanted to bring it to you early so we can talk about it. The intent there 
is that um, for private poor space owners, their economic benefit is uh, is determined by their own arrangement with whoever the operator is based on all those categories we put there before. And then if you if you if you're in a scenario where you're part of a unit but you didn't for whatever reason agree to be part of that unit, that was that's the threshold question we talked about before. Then um, your economic benefit is determined by your colleagues in the private sector, not influenced by federal payments. That's the intent. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Questions? Keep going. Okay. Let's keep on pace. So uh, again, it's not economic benefits is not defined in current statutes. So if we don't define it, uh, then Supervisor Kropatch has to go through those um, gyrations he was mentioning before about having to somehow figure out what those are on a global scale. So uh, uh, the other thing that is not defined is unit area. So we've defined it, and again, open to some suggestions here that um, the, what a unit area is. Uh, it means the pore space lying within the geologic formation proposed to be operated may include the area of geologic sequestration for one or more injection wells. Now, why is that important? A um, couple of things. Um, in 3511.315, Two, uh, Romanet two, current language reads like this, a description of the pore space and surface lands proposed to be so operated termed the unit area. Uh, that's in the application, a description of the pore space and surface lands proposed to be so operated termed the unit area. That's all that's there. There's no other definition about what a unit area is or what so operated means. And I think you've heard today and you'll hear from some operators that there's, um, uh, that that just is uh, that is that is too broad and not and, and not carefully defined enough. So um, uh, so by defining what the unit area is, we can know from both the poor space owner side and from the operator side exactly what we're talking about and where the project is. Uh, and so then there's other places that seem kind of innocuous, but if you go down to six there, um, we change the word um, you know provision for determining the poor space to be current language is used, we change that to included, uh, because you can have a unit where pore space is not technically used. There's no, there's no carbon stored there, but it's part of the unit. And we want the part, and we want every part of a unit to have the economic benefit of the previous definition. So want, again, I want that to be inclusive. Mr. Chairman, Let me pause go ahead. there. Go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. On this discussion of unit area, the the phrase unit area traditionally makes sense because it's typically surface down and it's contemplating a surface area and, and therefore area is a, a reasonable term. As you're contemplating a pore space volume, you're kind of shifting to whether that makes sense or doesn't make sense. Um, and I, I realize that we can have law and we can have engineering and, and the two will never meet. Um, but it's probably not a bad idea to be technically accurate where possible. Do you anticipate a circumstance where it's going to be more specific than a straight unit area type concept from the surface with regard to the pore space? Um, this this would be the time to get that right if that were the case. And, and I don't know if I'm making myself perfectly clear, but a unit area, area is not specific, perhaps, as we need it to be. Paid response? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Rothfuss, yeah, I, I think I know. I mean, it relates a little bit to the discussion previously about um, surface area as a proxy Correct. for um, for uh, geological storage, and that that is an open question. And um, again, I'm not saying that what we know is that current statute doesn't really define it at all. Right. Um, it just says it's got to be used. Okay. Um, but to what extent, and, and they relate to economic benefits. I'm not sure that we have it exactly right here. Um, so we we would be open to suggestions. Okay. okay. I understand the concept. Though. Follow up. Thank yeah. you. No. Others, while well, we got a break? No, keep going, Pete. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me just go real quickly. We covered the major things, uh, so uh, a, a lot of the rest of it is just uh, a little bit of help to um, make things flow a little better. Uh, you know, the application has to include federal. I'm on two thirty-five. 
11.315 now. Um, information, if the if federal porch place is included, um, use of a state, et cetera, changing to UIC class six and Roman at five. Um, uh, the included in the unit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Right, and back to uh, uh, Roman at eight, a proposed plan. Again, this is what this part of, is what is in the OGCC's order, a proposed plan for providing for economic benefits and the use of poor space within the unit, et cetera. Um, uh, so that is important. Uh, we added a little section that uh, uh, that we need to make sure, hold on, did I jump ahead? Yeah, I'm sorry, this is part of the application, the proposed plan for providing for economic benefits. This is part of a operator application, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead, the 316 is the order. Um, and then we also included another thing that the operator would have to add about location and identify of existing oil and gas production production or, or injection wells, et cetera, uh, so that we, uh, we and the agency are fully aware of where those are. Uh, moving on to 316, Again, um, conforming um, from environmental requirements to UAC class six in Roman at three, in Roman at four. Um, uh, there's several places throughout. I didn't talk about it specifically, but we've 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 ensured that the purpose of this part of the statute is to utilize uh, utilize uh, poor space for storage purposes. Um, the, the current language doesn't classify that as itself, uh, that the purpose of it is to actually utilize the pore space. So we've done that several places. Um, uh, that is in there as well. Um, I talked about in six, that has to do with uh, the economic benefits and making sure that economic benefits is defined uh, to the benefit of, of pore space owners. And um, Roman at six, Roman at seven uh, is part of that as well. I should have mentioned it earlier, but um, uh, Supervisor Kropatch talked about this. That that currently, what the the method of generating economic benefits from the use of poor space in the unit area is fair and equitable, and is reasonably designed to maximize the value of such use. Um, that doesn't really make a lot of sense when the value is entirely tied, as you talked about this morning, is entirely tied to injection of carbon. There is no value apart from the injection. Uh, so, um, what this order would would talk about is the method for providing for the economic benefits again to the poor space owner, and that um, that value um, you, you you derive value from maximizing the use of the poor space. Uh, so we kind of put the car before the horse in that language before. In order to maximize the value, you have to maximize the use, and that's what the method is: is, is providing the economic benefits to the poor space owner by maximizing its use. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your all's uh, attention to all of this. Um, uh, the other sort of major one uh, that, well, not major, but um, it's a little bit of belt and suspenders. I think Supervisor Kropatch might have a word or two about this, but the, the final one is in 3511-316-K. Uh, talking about uh, no order for unitization issued under this section shall act as to grant any person a right of use or access to a surface estate if that person would not otherwise have such a right. You talked about that already. We've added some language here to try to accommodate um, a potential situation uh, where uh, a poor space owner uh, may be in a unit uh, may have been put in a unit. Uh, uh, they, they were not part of the 80% threshold. Maybe uh, they're they're in a 20% or less. They uh, they're in a unit and they are they're worried about it and they try to um, to prevent a lateral well bore in their poor space using sort of trespass uh, using trespass law in order to prevent it from happening. So you've been unitized. Um, the area has been unitized. The project can only go forward uh, if if you're able to access that entire well bore. And there's some uh, there is perhaps some legal jeopardy of 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 a poor space owner not wanting to allow that that to happen, even though they're in a unit. So so I, I there's I don't even have an anecdote that that's happening currently. It's a little belt and suspenders, and I think Supervisor Kropatch might have some comments about that. So, Mr. Chairman, that's the general idea. Um, obviously. Um, open to suggestions and and talking about it, not asking that the committee um, do anything but advance it to the next 
uh, meeting in LSO language so folks have time to to look at it more carefully, digest it, and offer uh, uh, amendments. Committee at your next suggestions meeting. for Mr. Obermuller. Go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Obermuller, I, I do have a couple of questions. One, and I think it's about four things this is trying to accomplish. Maybe maybe more than that, but I see about Just four stay, key stay the page in place where you're at. Sure. Well, in in, in concept, and uh, there's a few places, but getting to adding or changing environmental requirements to underground injection control class six well requirements. So when this was written, obviously there was a, a lot of lack of understanding of what the requirements would actually be, and and a lot of that has come or is crystallized into class six. And so it seems like this could be changed because that's the focus of the environmental requirements. But the reason it was drafted generally in that provision was because it's hard to anticipate what the future will hold. And I think it was drafted with an understanding that they would want it to cover a broad range of, of possibilities. So my question here is, why change it to underground injection control class six well, as opposed to environmental requirements, uh, recognizing that we may actually cause problems in the future if there are other requirements that we need to be uh, regulating too, but now statutorily, we can only be looking to class six well requirements. Question on the change, Mr. Wormuller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Senator Rothfuss, because this part of the section is, is the class six section. Uh, and so the, so the UIC program that Director Parfit runs is the environmental requirements. No, Senator? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess maybe with this, then I would just check in with DEQ that there's nothing else that would need to be complied with outside of the requirements of, of class six on one hand. And if, if that is the case, the second would be what necessitates the change if they're equivalent, which is what the statement, as, as I take it, is. Mr. Parfit, this is more than a head nod. Would you come to the table? Um, so, Mr. Chairman, if I could get the specific question. One more time. Yeah. Tight. Mr. Chairman, the language right now has environmental requirements. Uh, the proposed amendment would be to change that to underground injection control class six well requirements in every instance. Um, the general language seems to ensure that the broader purpose of DEQ is available. And I'm trying to get at, is this functionally equivalent if we change the language? Perfect. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Rothfuss, um, I think as uh, Mr. Obermuller mentioned, this is specific to the Class 6 section. Uh, we don't see that this fundamentally uh, would be problematic if there's still an air quality permit required, the air, per, air quality permit would still have to be obtained and issued, just not under this section for this purpose. It would really be only the, the way this is structured. We, we don't have any objection to it. It would just, these are the application requirements uh, of the Oil and Gas Commission, and it would be specific in this instance to the class six wells. Good, Senator. Mr. Chairman, so I, I guess what I'm seeing is at best it does nothing, so what would it do? Mr. Barfitt or Mr. Obermuller? So, Mr. Chairman, Senator Rothfuss, the reason, as, as we discussed, the reason it was environmental before is because we didn't know what was happening. So it's broad, all environmental, but that's not the purpose of 3511, 314 through 319. The purpose, as uh, as the legislature declared, by the legislature is to protection of corresponding rights, compliance with UIC six. That's what the that's what the this part of the statute is is compliance with that, not not broadly. So it focuses our attention on what the statute is about and what the legislature said the purpose is. Senator, okay, I'll stop. 
on that okay. one there. Mr. Chairman, I do have standing down next. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, um, on the economic benefits, I, I think that makes sense from the, the perspective. It, it, let me understand if I if I do understand the intent. You want to make sure that it's all from the perspective of the poor space owners and that we basically eliminate um, any externalities from that calculation. Is that is, the, is that a fair analysis of that? Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Okay. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I, I guess what I would ask on that, would it be easier to just state that in the definition? Um, and I, I'm not sure it totally gets to that in the way that it's executed through the rest of it. But if that's the objective, I think that we can, maybe if this flexibility just for LSO, if we do get this drafted, to work towards that objective more than working towards the specific language. It, it sounds like that's the intent. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman, Senator Rothfuss. It, it, it is the intent, but it's it's not quite that simple in part because we have to think about, um, uh, we have to think about what the economic benefit is to a poor space owner who may not choose to be part of the unit and, and making sure that we have a good market-based rate for what, what they're going to get paid in that case. So that's why I, it's, it's a little open-ended, but it's it's uh, it's it's defined much better than in current statutes, so that we have a framework by which we can move forward for for units that uh, where we only reach eighty percent or eighty-one percent or ninety percent or whatever it is. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I like the intent. I was actually more concerned with the idea that maybe it's not open-ended enough because it does look at this from current expected practices of how to monetize it, and I was more worried about the fact that maybe some other cool idea that we haven't really thought of comes along uh, and that we haven't appropriately accounted for those considerations just because we don't see it yet. You got any of those ideas? Mr. Go ahead. Chairman, yeah, thank you, Senator Rothfuss. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly open to conversation about how we make okay. sure we're, the unknown, we're as inclusive unknown, as possible. Mr. Yeah, Chairman. yeah. As, <laughs> Okay. As your friend Donald Rumsfeld said, yes. <laughs> exactly. All right, <laughs> all right that's good. all I've got for now. Good, Thank everything. You. Okay. Committee, oh, we got a break? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, I think this is a, a, a good step in the right direction. Earlier uh, today, uh, comments and concerns I have about the, the, we're on this edge of this new value of, of poor space. Mm. Uh, and it reminds me of the history of the original idea of severance of between mineral and the surface owners and some of the things we could learn from that. And so I think this is a right sort of thing to start uh, reflecting on how do we protect those poor space ownership and their rights. And I mean, I think this is a good start, but there's a lot of conversation I'd like to see in our committee about, about what protection should be for those because the, the people now are not even going to understand in many ways the value of what they have. And so, um, and others will know the value and come and seek to uh, maybe sever. So there's a lot of things here, but I think this is a good start in terms of how we begin to interact with the, the poor space ownership and see that they're protected. So committee, everybody comfortable with this start? Sounds like it. Pete, do you have anything else? Ms. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I was just going to say if, if we do want to, move this forward, which I think is a good idea in concept. I, I think it's worth not just having it drafted up by also, but actually putting together a little working group of stakeholders on this one mm -hmm. uh, to maybe walk through that draft, talk among uh, stakeholders and, and then bring that product back. So, um, I do have some more just specific language concerns, uh, but I, I don't want to I see two people go to through right. all of that right now. I see two people to my right. It sounds like a great community. choice. I'm yeah. happy okay. to. Absolutely. All right, yeah. we're good. Not Anybody else want to join these folks? It's yours. All right. Yeah, do you want to get started? Who? <laughs> oh, I got an absolutely not. Right now, it's these two. Would you work with our good esteemed staff right there? Okay. We good? Okay. Well, see what the agency said in the public comment. Yeah, yeah, we're going to get to that, but I'm just making sure I'm not leaving the table without anybody volunteering. Okay. Pete, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Agencies, staff, anybody else would like to comment on this? Anybody in the room? We're going to get to Mr. Dowling and his visitors here in just a moment. Okay, anybody else? All right. 
Everybody comfortable with this? You want to you want to put it in formal motion? Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. I move that we form a working group to work with stakeholders and staff to draft the proposed language regarding unitization of CCUS uh, into legislation for consideration at the next meeting. You and the representative have that assignment. Second? Second. Any discussion? Move the second. Go to work. Thank you. Appreciate your volunteerism. Okay. Anybody else? Mr. Dowling, would you bring your guest forward? You got a lot of guests. Good. Do we need more chairs? Yeah. Everybody comfortable where they can reach a mic? I want to thank you, good folks, for uh, patiently waiting for your opportunity. I understand you probably traveled. Mr. Dowling, you want to do some introductions for us? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jonathan Downing uh, on behalf of Frontier Carbon Solutions. Uh, on my far right, our president and co-CEO, Robbie Rocky. Uh, next to him, our Director of Engineering, Alicia Summers. And next to me, Eric Holt, uh, Chief Counsel and handles land, VP land. Thank you. Where did everybody travel from? Good afternoon. We're from Dallas, Mr. Chairman. All the way up in Dallas today. Yes, Thank you. Thank you for coming to Wyoming. Appreciate Absolutely. your project. I've heard about it. Saw a lot of enthusiasm in the presentation uh, back during the session. Who gets to speak first? Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll kick us off. I'm Robbie Rocky, the, the president of Frontier. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to discuss our project. And, and just really quickly before we begin, uh, a huge thank you to the University of Wyoming School of Energy Resources. Uh, we are still in a bit of disbelief about the size of the grant award we received. Uh, and I think it's a tremendous opportunity for Wyoming. Thank you. So jumping into the first slide, uh, the next one there. We are a carbon storage development company. Uh, and I think before I dive too deep into that, I'd just like to say, you know, we're hydrocarbon folks. We come from an oil and gas background, most of it in CO2 handling, a lot of it in Wyoming and in Louisiana. So this is uh, really a derivative skill set of the traditional energy industry and one we're excited to be a part of. We also have a team of dedicated finance folks that help manage some of these things that are a bit more esoteric, 45Q tax credits, voluntary carbon offset credits. Uh, and try to remove some of the opaqueness in that market so we can see a project to investability. And we're backed by a group called Tailwater Capital, large infrastructure fund out of Dallas to do projects like this. I'll jump to the next slide, please. We are wholly focused in Wyoming, in the Green River Basin, and, and really for, for one reason, it's the intersection of these three really important categories. We have some of not just Wyoming's, but the United States' most important domestic resources, huge power corridor, major industrial corridor, but also sits on top of really, really good carbon storage. And carbon storage is, is a finite resource. Wyoming has, has some of the best across the Mountain West. Next slide, please. There was some talk earlier about um, capture codes, store codes, tax credits. So I thought a, a, a little bit of a cartoon just to show where we sit at Frontier. We are right in the middle there. We are, the best way to think of us is, is store codes, so kind of like a midstream company. We work with industrial facilities. We work with, you know, a direct air capture facility to identify the best technology to handle their emissions and address their carbon management goals. And then we build the compression, the pipelines and the wells, uh, handle the permitting, do the class six work, uh, all the financial assurances, all the monitoring, all the operations associated with that. But this is this is us. We're right in the kind of in the center of, of this. So we are, you know, when we talk, we, we talk about tax credits or anything like that. We are store co. So we don't generate 45 Q tax credits. We help a carbon capture company realize those 45 Q tax credits. Uh, next slide, please. So just a key milestones and and it'll lead into what I hope is a good opportunity for us to answer some of the questions that have been raised earlier. But we have developed and submitted three class six permits. Uh, that effort represents you know, over, over a couple years of work. Um, each of those class six permits is about a million dollars of investment apiece. Uh, we worked very closely with the DQ to understand what they wanted to see in those permits before delivering them. Uh, they they tap out to about 400 pages each. We're going to bring some, but you know, we would have had to check bags. And so we, you know, we'll, we'll send you a PDF. Uh, we have six additional class six permits planned for later this year. 
And so it's certainly topical. You think about the resources that will be available to DEQ to review those. Um, over the last 18 months, we've executed about 45,000 acres of force space lease across Southwest Wyoming. And we believe that's one of the largest consolidated storage positions in the U.S. Uh, most importantly, that's eight lessors. Uh, so a very small landowner group, and we've done a tremendous amount of work with to help them understand what the value is of poor space. Um, concurrent with that, we're in feed engineering, which is a really advanced engineering process with Shell to develop carbon capture solutions for natural gas-fired boilers, for coal-fired boilers, for kilns, for cow signers, these key carbon emitting facilities at some of Wyoming's most important industries and to create a, an economic solution to move forward with them. Uh, and really the, to bury the lead here, we are preparing to file the first unitization application for carbon storage on a 12,000 acre unit uh, here sometime later this summer. So the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission has been extremely constructive as we've moved through that dialogue with what they expect to see from us and comparing that to what we've delivered to the DEQ in the class six process. On unitization, that first unit is, is about 12,000 acres. We have 93% of that unit leased. Uh, at unitization, our, our hope is we're gonna be at 99%, if not 100, we're, we're very close. On the topic of economic benefit at application, uh, we believe we should be able to show effectively the same economic benefits to everyone. It's, it's effectively the same lease terms across the entire leasehold position. Um, additionally, we took some of those leases you know, well over a year ago uh, a small portion. And then, you know, over the subsequent six to nine months, we were able to take some much larger lease positions. Um, those lessors very clearly understood the value of their poor space ownership. And so uh, we were price takers in that situation. Uh, but we did go back to our early lessors and increase their economics. So that unit should have parity on the economics across the, across the entire leasehold when we get to unitization. Um, I'll pause there because I know we've talked a lot about items that pertain to unionization, um, how these projects go, uh, and open it up for any questions from the committee. But we are very excited. It's been a, a tremendous opportunity for Wyoming. Literally, the effort goes back uh, multiple years, and the, and the support from the, the DEQ, the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, uh, the Office of State Lands and Investments to, to develop the form for that first state lease, uh, and then all the other support across the state. Just very excited and proud to be here to work on this project. You seem well advanced in everything that you're doing, more so than others. Co-chair? Oh, here. go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, appreciate your slides. That was very great. And I would love some insight into your um, experience with unitization. So maybe some things like uh, how many different landowners were involved, uh, just how that experience worked for you. Obviously, you achieved success, how long it took you to do that. Give us some insight just into what practically that looks like. It ties in with, I said, you're well advanced beyond everybody else. We're all curious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Representative Lolly, we are pr preparing the first unionization application. So we are we are learning as we go. Uh, we all come from, from an oil and gas background, a, a lot of water flood units, a lot of CO2 units, uh, some big federal units. And so I think we, we understand the mechanics of unionization and oil and gas application. Uh, and then are working with the with the conservation commission to say hey how 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 does that fit in the context of a carbon storage unit um what what is a little unique here uh, is we need to show to the commission that we have the rights for where that co2 will be 20 years from now so almost a, a generational amount of leasehold that needs to be assembled for these first units uh, and, and it has been really constructive i, I think we heard earlier that there is a, a permit to inject and a permit to construct a kind of a two-step process for the DEQ and the permit to construct um, works alongside the unitization process, which ultimately leads to the permit to inject. Um, I'd say with our, with our landowners on the concept of unitization, uh, as with any new industry, we did a lot of education with them and just, you know, an analogous to oil and gas. And many of them come from you know, some type of hydrocarbon background or experience. So, uh, we were fortunate to have a, a you know start on second or third base with them on that education, but we didn't receive any any pushback on the on the idea of unionization uh, because that is really a requirement for them to receive revenue. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Don't you say there was someone? There? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think you were maybe making a joke, but you said um, you'd have to check your bags if you had to bring your the 400 page applications and copies for us to look at. But I'm guessing that contains proprietary information. So I just want to be clear. Is that public information what you have in your application? 
or is that, um, you know, I, I would be interested in seeing what, what that document looks like to the extent you can share it with us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Ellis, those actually are public. They're on the DEQ's website. Um, they, 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 they have a lot, a lot of our hard work is in there, but you know, some of those things are as a new industry, we think we need to show our homework right. to be frank. That was one of my concerns too, Senator, go ahead. Chairman, gentlemen, thank you, ladies. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, what do you project you can put in 12,000 acres? How many tons at what PSI? I'm well, just curious. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, Representative Tarver, we are permitting those three wells for 500,000 tons per year uh, at 2,100 PSI, surface injection pressure, which is not atypical for a typical EOR injection. So one and a half million tons total out of three years, uh, over the, or out of three wells over the next 20 years is our proposed unit. And answered, Representative? Anybody else? I'd like to hear from the two that have been silent. <laughs> Question for the two that have been silent. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. Go ahead. Based on what I heard earlier, the 45Q credits would go to the industrial components themselves. You guys would not take a part of that. So what is the revenue stream specifically that enables you to be successful? Go ahead. <laughs> no, Mr. Please, Chair, like to Conrad, yeah. Yeah. I will hand this to, to my partner, Alicia Summers. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Conrad. So we provide the service, transportation, compression, transportation, storage, monitoring, uh, post-injection site care for those emitters uh, for a service, basically a tolling fee. So think of it as similar to a midstream company. Uh, that's how we generate our revenue. Mm -hmm. Answer it. Okay. Any further questions? Sir, would you like to say something? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm okay, okay we're you. good. <laughs> Mr. Downing, do you want to close it out? Uh, we're great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time, and uh, we'll always be available for whatever we can answer. Thank you. I just say to the committee, I saw a lot of passion for this project from this company last winter, uh, and uh, thank them for coming and being interested in Wyoming. I'm sure Dallas to Kimmer, you had to get creative to get here, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anybody else have any questions on this section? Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay, we'll move on. Anybody need a break? Okay, let's keep pressing forward. Sequestration revenue and credits. Uh, Director Scoggin and Deputy Director Crowder. Thank you, welcome, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, thanks for having us today. Um, I understand the purpose was, you were very much interested in our first ever special use lease related to um, poor space leasing. So with that, before I get into that, I, I'm Jennifer Scoggin, the Director of the Office of State Lands and Investments. I brought with me Jason Crowder, the Deputy Director, and um, he was involved in a lot of the nitty gritty negotiating. So I, I thought perhaps he could add some color to um, my remarks. But you know, first and foremost, for those folks who are maybe new, um, just wanted to kind of say, well, why do we do this? Um, why are we um, going to lease poor space um, underneath state lands? Um, as, mo as many of you know, lands were gifted to the state of Wyoming um, upon statehood to support public education and other certain institutions. Um, we have institutional lands as well. Um, by the state constitution, um, it provides that the Board of Land Commissioners, which are the five statewide elected officials, um, that in with the direction of the legislature, um, they manage state lands for the benefit of certain trust beneficiaries, largely K through 12 education. And as I mentioned, some institutions such as UW, the Veterans Home, um, those sorts of things. So um, OSLI, Office of State Lands, we are the administrative arm for the State Board of Land Commissioners. And um, we have a fiduciary duty to um, leverage the trust asset, which are the state lands, um, to generate revenue um, for, um, 
for those endeavors. So we managed the state lands in a, in a variety of ways, a lot of different uses, everything from um, agricultural grazing leasing to, you know, trona leasing, oil and gas leasing, um, all kinds of different types of commercial leasing. So we're really looking to generate revenue for the on the state trust lands or in the subsurface um, to help support um, K through 12 education or the institution, depending upon the classification of the lands. So um, back to our poor space lease. Um, back in uh, 2021. Uh, we were approached by um, Frontier um, Carbon Solutions, and, and they said, hey, we're looking to do um, carbon sequestration in Wyoming. We'd like to look at state lands. Um, you know, can are you interested in that? And of course, um, Jason and I looked at each other and said, say what? <laughs> what are we doing here? We we I'll make this clear, I guess, in the beginning is we are very much pioneers in the poor space leasing. We are not experts. And so a lot of what we did and um, the results of that are just sort of trial and error, trying to move something forward, trying to move the ball forward, trying to be um, entrepreneurial in this industry. And it's not easy. I mean, it's complicated. It's it's difficult. And um, as I go through kind of some of the highlights and the, the terms of the lease that the uh, Board of Land Commissioners ultimately approved at their February 27th, uh, 2023 meeting, um, you'll, you'll kind of see that not all of this is in our wheelhouse, but we tried to get as much information as we could. And ultimately, we may find out that um, you know, the amount that we received isn't enough. And so with the next opportunity, we'll, we'll, we'll do better next time. Maybe some of the terms we thought would work really aren't going to work. But um, in working with Frontier, we were really just trying to, to move something forward that was a benefit um, to, uh, to this endeavor as well as to the trust beneficiaries. So as I mentioned, um, on February 27th, 2023, the State Board Land Commissioners um, approved a um, special use lease with Pond Field LLC, which is a, a frontier um, entity, and it's for um, leasing of uh, for carbon dioxide storage in subsurface pore space beneath trust land, specifically in Sweetwater, Lincoln, and Uinta County, um, approximately 6,720 acres um, of state lands are at issue. Um, it, this is an interesting lease because um, we, we looked at different scenarios with Frontier, but ultimately um, as their plans evolved and their vision evolved, um, this, this particular lease will not authorize any um, surface infrastructure located on state land. So we're just specifically leasing the pore space for injecting CO2. Um, the But it is part of a, a larger unit, if you will. You've they talked a little bit about unitization, but we are, are part of a, a bigger project, if you will. So we're not the only ones involved, but the, the monitoring wells, the injection wells, the pipelines will all be located on other lands other than the state trust lands. So negotiations, as I mentioned, um, they transpired for quite some time as we kind of flailed around and tried to get whatever expertise we could. Um, we, we didn't know what we didn't know. Um, as I said, there are new concerns, probably things we haven't even thought of, but um, may become apparent in the future that we will uh, course correct for in the future. Um, there were no examples of leasing of this type. Uh, we did reach out to um, private um, attorneys uh, that we understood had been working with private landowners to see um, what, if anything, they could provide any kind of information that might be helpful. Um, in drafting a, a lease, um, Frontier, they provided us with um, some uh, potential terms. They were trying to help us sort of further this, um, but we we understood that in our leasing, we also needed to be really clear um, about what rights we were going to allow here and what we were not going to allow here, because as I mentioned, we do have this fiduciary duty. Um, so we are definitely in uncharted territory. Um, in trying to fit, figure out how to facilitate this, we didn't know if this, if um, you know, carbon storage, if car injection, if any of that was ever even going to really come to fruition. So we also had to protect um, the the trust beneficiaries by you know having an out, if you will, if the project didn't go forward. Um, they uh, Frontier had asked for a lease term of 58 years, and obviously we didn't want to be 
um, held to that if in fact uh, the the project wasn't going to move forward. And and they in turn they didn't want to have to put up a, a bunch of capital if in fact this really wasn't going to be something that was going to succeed or move forward as well. So we tried to look at okay how can we do this that works for everybody. So we looked at kind of a we actually started with one of our uh, wind energy leases, um, trying to figure out how could we um, get payment at certain benchmarks within um, the during the project. And so we divided the lease into four into four stages of development. We have the development term, which includes the due diligence and the permitting. We have the construction term, which is obviously when the facility would be constructed. We have the operations term, which is when the CO2 would uh, begin to be injected until they cease injection. And then we have a, the closure and monitoring term, which is the reclamation or mediation, all of that. Um, the, other, the other challenge we had is that when we started into the negotiations with um, Frontier, um, the legislature was working on legislation for the transfer of the liability ultimately to the state. And so how do you, how do you contract for something that um, may happen in the future. And then we had the last legislative session too, where we thought, well, could they change those statutes? Could they further refine them? And you can't, you know, say, okay, we all want to, we all want this to be the case, should this law happen? So we had to, we had to contract for what the law is today or at the time of the signing of the lease. Um, but we had to provide for in the future that should the law change, should, should the changes to the statutes that go into effect July 1st of 2023, should they happen, that we have the ability to amend the lease so that we all understand what we're doing. So that was also something we had to consider. So I mentioned payments for different sort of benchmarks in the process. What we decided to ultimately do um, is compensate at certain points um, in the project. The first, we had we had bonus uh, payments. The first bonus payment was the initial bonus payment. And um, so that was paid within five days of um, the board approving the lease. Um, and we calculated that based on the acreage, the, the number of acres of state lands that um, were going to be contained within the lease. We didn't know how else to do it. We didn't have um, a big geologic study to know the specifics about the pore space, but we had to start somewhere. So that was, um, we decided that would be uh, $75 per acre. So once the lease was approved by the board and signed, um, we received an initial bonus payment. It was about $504,000, I believe. So then we have a second bonus payment in the structure and that will come into play five, within five days of the date on which aggregate volumes of CO2 contractually committed to the facility exceeds 100,000 metric tons per year. And we decided that payment would be $25 per acre. So when that happens, that would be $168,000. And then a third bonus payment um, would be received within five days of the first date on which um, Pondfield begins commercial injections of CO2 into the storage unit for permanent storage. And that was uh, decided to be $25 per acre, so another $168,000 at that time. So in addition to those bonus uh, payments, uh, we have a storage fee. And we tried to figure out how do we, you know, what is fair compensation for the for the storage? Um, in our discussions, negotiations, um, research, uh, we found that a dollar per ton of CO2 injected to the storage unit was market rate, if you will, at the time. And so our storage fee is based on the proportion of state lands that's within the project or the unit, if you will, um, that will be utilized um, on a surface acreage basis. So again, as I mentioned, when this was all being negotiated, we understood that to be market rate at the time. So we believe that's gonna be approximately $225,000 per year, but that would be subject to um, uh, the cons uh, consumer price index adjustment so that we um, are making sure that uh, we're, we're staying on top of things. Um, that uh, once Pondfield um, commences the operations term and all of that, that's when the, the CPI comes into play. So as I mentioned, um, we, we wanted to have some outs if this thing didn't go forward. So there are certain places within the lease that allow us to terminate. Um, first, the first one is if um, the lessee fails to apply for their class six permit within four years of the effective date, I believe Frontier's already done that. 
Um, the next one is if the lessee fails to completely construct and permit the facility such that storage of CO2 commences within 11 years. If they don't do that, then um, we can terminate. And then additionally, um, if the lessee fails to begin injection into the storage unit within 11 years after the effective date of the agreement, we can also terminate. So those are some ways we can get out of it if the um, facility isn't going to move forward. Then the other things we were thinking about were, you know, bonding for um, potential um, problems that might occur along the way. Um, so, you know, our rules require that we obtain a bond sufficient to assure compliance with all terms and conditions of the lease. But we also recognize that, you know, DEQ has a has a bonding component to their permitting. Um, so, you know, we work with um, the lessee to make sure that whatever they're bonding with DEQ, in fact, would cover state lands. But then we also have an additional bond um, to ensure compliance with other lease terms, such as payment. Um, once the project reaches the operations term, we will collect $112,500 in bond. This is um, calculated based on six months of our expected annual storage fees to make sure that we actually get paid. So if for some reason um, payment stops, we would have that and could pull that bond to, to pay that and then figure out from a legal perspective what next steps might be. Um, if if payments are late, we do have an 18% interest rate per annum um, until the date that the payments are made. And then finally, as, a, as another way to protect ourselves, we have a most favored nations clause in the lease so that if we find out that another participant is um, getting uh, financial terms that are more favorable than what we were able to negotiate, we should be entitled to those as well. So that kind of lays out for you sort of the highlights of the lease. Um, as I mentioned, we're pioneers, we're forging ahead. We may find out that we have to make some changes to the next um, lease that we're doing, but uh, we, we have a template, we're marching forward. And as we learn new things, in fact, Jason and I were talking here today as we were listening to some of the testimony, we were learning things and thinking, oh, maybe we should address that in the next lease. So um, in any event, that would conclude my testimony. Deputy Director, I'm not sure if you have things you want to add to that since you were more in the weeds of the negotiations. Deputy Director, you'd like to add to that? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, just real quickly, it, it was a long and tedious process to get to the document we have now. It's roughly 32 pages, which is one of our most lengthy ones we have. And, and to express our gratitude to Frontier and, and Robbie and his whole crew, um, they were great in helping us construct this document to make sure that we addressed what they were bringing to us in this new venture were important parts to address, but also showing a lot of patience with us as we uh, move through the process. Uh, as the director mentioned, uh, we have five critical points when we negotiate any lease and with a new venture like this, these are even more important. So I'll, I'll just list those and, and for your consideration uh, and understanding when we go into any lease, when we go into the next carbon capture lease, um, these are the, the things that we look at. Obviously, we have to realize market rates and we try to, to leverage the private negotiations as much as possible. So we sat back quite a bit in this uh, process to allow Frontier to have those private negotiations to ensure that the private market was creating itself, was identifying itself before the state came in and tried to determine what those rates might be. So, so we did sit back. Um, we also have this idea of balancing when do you get the revenue? And as the director mentioned, do you get it up front if the project really never reaches um, a development or, or operational phase, or do you get it on the back end through royalty? And I think we struck a good balance in this document to, to get a good amount of bonus payments up front to to ensure one, we were uh, monetizing the asset appropriately for the benefit of the beneficiaries, but two, um, as this goes on and it's gonna go on for a long time, uh, we're also monetizing that for future beneficiaries going forward. The second is that we ensure that the, the resource is treated appropriately. Obviously we are not the experts as the director, director mentioned um, in this capacity. Uh, we're not geologists, we're not economists. Um, so we leveraged a lot of folks to ensure that the resource was treated appropriately and we'll continue to, to leverage those folks. And, and mostly that's going to be the DEQ and the OGCC uh, going forward and to ensure that we comply with any laws of the state, any new laws or existing laws that the legislature uh, might put in. 
The third is to cover our risks um, as close to 100% as possible. The director mentioned the financial assurances and the bonding. Those were critical pieces in the lease and, and in every lease that we do. So uh, that was a key component to ensure that not only the resource was treated appropriately with the experts at the table, but also the beneficiaries as well, uh, make sure those payments are made and on time. And then as much as possible to keep that multiple use philosophy in place, as the director mentioned, this lease doesn't contemplate uh, any surface activities, uh, but it also still allows oil and gas to development to occur and that uh, some drill through with co cooperation and coordination can occur. And so we're actually able to uh, keep all of the resources um, available for development and for revenue generation uh, going forward. And um, uh, to keep, a lessee, if it's Frontier, Pond Field, or any subsequent lessee that would come into this lease, uh, to ensure that they're capable and competent of operating the lease and complying with all the lease terms going forward. As the director mentioned, this is an extremely long-term lease, and the people we're dealing with today, even the people sitting at this table likely, uh, will not be here when this lease reaches the closure and monitoring phase. So we need to ensure that the lease still is uh, uh, credible enough, has enough integrity to keep the folks at the table who are in these seats at that time, not only on the lessor, but the lessee side. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I've been answering. Questions. Thank you. Committee questions for our state Mr. director. Mr. Chairman. Or our deputy director. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me say that it's, it's a great benefit to the state of Wyoming that uh, we you could step out into this space. Uh, uh, because of some of the things you mentioned, the fiduciary duty you have, how how diligently you work through that process, because I learned a lot here, and, and it's really, I'd love to know more at some point about what you've done, but, um, and, and what you've learned uh, through this process, because um, you you hit a lot of some of the concerns I have about protection uh, for poor state, poor space owners. There you go. That's hard to say. But, but the kinds of things that they might not know because it's such a new area that you've already sort of embedded in your organization. So I just think that's going to be a great asset. It's part of what makes Wyoming, I think, unique and uniquely advantaged to move forward in this situation. So I appreciate all that you guys shared. And again, would love to follow up with you personally about some of the, the things that you've learned because this is a really very valuable to some of the things I've been talking generally about that I feel like that we need to work through to protect those who own the four spaces to uh, make sure that uh, all of it is, uh, they just understand all these different things. So thank you. Either of you like to respond. Mr. Chairman, Representative Lawley, um, thank you very much for that. It, it's been difficult because, you know, with the fiduciary duty, we're always worried about protecting that asset because we have to protect it for future generations as well. And also, as um, the deputy said, you know, we're all about multiple use of the asset. So we want to leverage as much as we can. Um, but every opportunity when, you know, we come to meetings like this or we're, we're dealing with, you um, you know, applicants or um, if I'm at the Oil and Gas Commission, um, we are learning new things and we have a running list and we're committed to making it better each and every time that we have an opportunity uh, to enter into a poor space lease. Mr. Thank Crowder. you. Oh, okay. Committee, further questions for our director? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I think um, I heard you say that this doesn't affect surface at all. So I was just wondering, I'm an ag guy first. Um, is this affecting any of our grazing leases or or is there an opportunity that do you lease the uh, below to the CO2 guys and then they still have the ability to lease the surface? Is that um, kind of what we're going for there? Director, Deputy, Deputy Director, either one? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Banks, that's a great question. You're right. Uh, no surface is contemplated in this lease, but there could be something like a monitoring well or, or something that DEQ would require that may come onto the property. And the reason we didn't uh, talk about any surface use in this lease was that that introduces a whole nother level of complexity, a whole nother level of market analysis to determine what's the appropriate um, uh, addition to the lease in that in that sense. We were able to, to not go there, and with 
Frontiers project, we were able to not go there. So that was helpful. But in the future, if that does need to happen, we put in the lease that that has to be approved by the lessor before it can happen. Uh, one of the important things to note is the director mentioned this is um, done under the authority of the Board of Land Commissioner's rules and regulations, specifically Chapter uh, 5 for special use leasing. And in that, the surface lessee has the ability and the, and the requirement to not only be notified of the project, any new surface activity, uh, but also uh, uh, grant consent to that project if it doesn't have a, an in, impact to their existing leasehold. If it does have an impact, they can give us that information and we can try to mitigate that or move the project somewhere else. So they have the ability to be at the table at that point. Um, since this was done under Chapter 6 of the rules, they were given that opportunity this time. Uh, they were all made aware that no surface activities and therefore no surface impact was expected. And so we, we gained consent um, from the ones we could get a hold of anyway. Uh, but going into the future, not only do they get notif notified, not only do they have the ability to provide consent or not, but they also get paid a surface impact payment if there is an impact to that. Um, and that's a negotiated payment between the, the new lessee or, or the carbon capture company and that surface uh, or grazing lessee at the time. Representative, we covered? Okay. Further committee questions? No. Okay. Thank you. So we have some presentations now, I think, starting with Danbury, is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Pete Obermuller, Petroleum Association of Wyoming. Um, you've all heard enough from me today, so I brought uh, some friends. Um, uh, from Denberry Resources, uh, Greg Schnocky and Matthew Dahan. Is that right? Dahan? Dahan. Dahan. Uh, I'm going to walk you through just four slides um, as quickly as we can uh, about uh, an incentive idea that we have, um, uh, that they have come up with. I can't take any credit for it, uh, other than thinking a lot about what we talked about before, about the window that we have in Wyoming, um, where we are ahead of the game on carbon uh, capture and sequestration. We've long been ahead of the game on enhanced oil recovery. And uh, we're in the situation where the federal government has um, put in place a tax credit for permanent storage that has really moved the needle. Uh, and they have clearly favored permanent storage in their incentive program uh, over enhanced oil recovery. We have a long history of enhanced oil recovery in Wyoming. And uh, and so we thought about how we could, um, Wyoming could step up to the plate to help sort of close that gap in incentives. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to our friends from Denbury and they will walk you through those slides. Uh, Ms. Sherman, I think you have hard copies of them. I think, yeah, Herzog Lolly has them. There are some extras in the back as well for those in the audience. Gentlemen, oh, it's up on the screen too, amazing. Nice, good job, thanks guys. They never miss. Gentlemen, Denbury, go ahead. Yes. Uh, Either one of you. Yeah, yeah it's on. Mr. Commissioner, uh, members of the committee, thank you for giving us the time. My name is Matt Dayan. I'm Senior Vice President of Business Development and Technology with Denbury. With me is Greg Schnocke. He's our Vice President of Government Relations. Before I get into this presentation, I want to take a moment and answer a question that was given to Pete earlier regarding in enhanced oil recovery, how much CO2 actually stays there when we're done. So during the break, we actually went and had our folks pull that information. Uh, it's part of the greenhouse gas reporting rules, so it's all actually public, although you'd have to combine it to get there. Over the last five years in the 24 projects we have working around the United States in six different states, 99.2% of the CO2 that gets there stays there. That 0.8% is really tied to maintenance operations if you have to blow down a compressor to work on it, depressurize the pipeline, and that CO2 is vented. So it's close to 100 as we can get, but so pretty good track record. So uh, this concept, uh, we're really making a proposal here that's going to solve or at least try and tackle two challenges that the state has. One is capturing CO2 off of power plants, and the other is uh, trying to extract additional oil resources that lie in mature oil fields throughout the state. We do that by this, pre, uh, this uh, recommendation on creating what I call a, a CCUS value chain. So starting with the carbon capture at power plants, currently being incentivized by the 45Q tax credit. Uh, as Pete pointed out, if that CO2 goes to dedicated storage, they'll get $85 a ton. If it goes to enhanced soil recovery or some other form of utilization, it'll get $60 a ton. 
that value chain only works if we connect the emitter to to a to a place for that CO2 to go. That's done by dedicated CO2 pipelines. They're slightly different. They're ANSI 900. They operate at higher pressure. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we move CO2 in dense phase, so it's almost a liquid. We can pump it. It's far more efficient to do that. Wyoming is blessed with infrastructure already, stretching across the entire state. Our pipelines and pipelines of others uh, move CO2. Been doing it for like since the mid 80s, I think. Um, then we get into enhanced soil recovery. And the thing here is to encourage the use of captured CO2 from Wyoming power plants in Wyoming's EOR potential assets. Said differently, we're, we're putting captured CO2 to use to create value and not just simply store it. Although storage through EOR, as I mentioned, over 99%, stays in the ground, uh, it is an effective way to store CO2. Now, CO2 EUR projects I'll show you in a little bit, they are not necessarily a steady offtaker of CO2. So tying that into this chain, taking a little bit further, uh, the dedicated storage sites that's been the topic of most of the discussion today are gonna be a value part of that, right? They're always there to take the balance of the CO2. Finally, as we look at trying to try this all together is this concept that when we develop new oil fields that would have otherwise have been stranded, uh, they are gonna generate severance tax revenue for the state, right? Currently set at 6%. The thought here is that we look to the state to take some of that severance tax and bring it back to the emitter such that they can cover off at least a portion of that gap in the 45Q tax credit which currently today sits at $25. Can I get the next slide? So let me jump to the EOR challenge. And I'm gonna use the Powder River as an example, but this, this story really fits with a, the bulk of Wyoming. Most of the big targets have already been uh, developed. If I clear the slide for you, on the left is a map of the Powder River. That's uh, all the oil fields as Denbury knows them. Uh, they're color coded, so by color, uh, by size. So the red ones are the biggest uh, as far as oil in place. And as we get down to green, those are the smallest fields. Also on there, you'll see the green core pipeline, the Denbury's pipeline that runs through the map going to the north. And then the black pipeline is uh, Crescent Energies that services Salt Creek. And if you look really hard, you can see some little red circles that represent the big emission sources uh, pick around Gillette, and then down at the bottom now the Dave Johnson uh, power plant. As I go over to the graph, this is a, uh, an example of the life of a EOR project. The green line is oil production, and the yellow line is what we call CO2 purchase or CO2 that is brought to the field for use. So I'll point out a few things here. One, these are long-term projects. It takes a long time to see the fruits of our labor, right? In this example, we probably starting investment two years before you see that production even start and you don't hit peak production until about six years after that. Couple that with the fact that we have to bring large quantities of CO2 to, to the field in the beginning. So there's no revenue coming in while, while we repressurize the field and begin moving CO2 through the reservoir. Over time, as CO2 comes to a producing well and is, is oh, sorry, yeah. is uh, over time, as CO2 is brought to the producers, we bring it to the surface, we separate oil from CO2, we re-inject that back in, and that means we have to bring less CO2 to the field over time. So what are the challenges in the Powder River? Reservoirs are typically thin and they're typically tight. So when you look at the, that map, these fields cover massive areas, but they have very thin oil pay, which translates to low density of, of target. Said differently, there's a lot of wells that we have to incorporate over large distances, running multiple pipelines, uh, building big facilities and bringing all that fluid to those facilities. The fact that the reservoirs are tight means that we can't inject CO2 it, uh, very quickly, which means it moves to the reservoir very slowly, which translates to a delayed response in oil production. You tie that with the big capital dollars that are spent up front and the large amounts of CO2 that are brought to the field early, 
makes these uh, projects very economically challenged. Now, the good, the good side of this is we typically see in our business, we can get another 10 or 20% of the oil that was originally there out of the ground through this process. So there is a big carrot. It just takes a long time to get it. And when I've circled back to the bottom of that slide, we give an example here of what the severance tax benefit uh, received by the state is. And at today's oil price, or maybe last week's oil price is a little bit lower today, $75, about four and a half million dollars per million barrels produced through this process. So I have a field that if I can extract 50 million barrels from, that's $225 million to the state in severance tax revenue at that oil price. Now there probably would be additional ad valorem uh, benefits as well. Didn't really incorporate that into this thought. So last slide, if I could. So we really wanted to hit home the fact that this whole CCUS business is very, very capital intensive. And we give some examples here. They're just examples. They're ranges of, of costs. If I started the capture side on a coal plant or a natural gas power plant, to capture CO2, we look at this typically in uh, dollars per annual ton. So as an example, if I have a capture plant that's going to capture a million tons a year, if I take the midpoint of that, the capital invested in that is going to be in the range of $400 million. Now, if you get into power plants, the coal plants that still need sulfur dioxide removal, NOx removal, that's just additional money that has to be brought in there. Pipeline. So Denver just put in a 105-mile pipeline uh, in Montana back in the end of 2021. Uh, so we're very familiar with what the costs are. They're ranging anywhere from a million and a half to $4 million a mile, right? It really depends on the terrain you're going through. If you're going near populated areas, it gets far more expensive. And there's operating costs. But if I take an example of 50-mile run of pipeline, that's $140 million of capital. The CO2 EOR projects, we look at capital a little bit different there, but uh, on a dollar per barrel recovered, right? So how much oil am I going to get over time out? And what does that capital look like? That's in the 10 to $20. So we got a 50 million barrel target. That's $550 million of CapEx. Also very expensive to operate these fields because we're running big compression um, uh, fleets to recycle that CO2. And lastly, on the saline aquifer side, Denver is in this business. We're doing, we got a site here that we're working towards uh, submitting permits in north of Gillette and a lot of work in other parts of the country as well. Uh, we've we've said publicly our estimates, these are two to four million dollars a metric ton to develop capital over the life of that project. So a hundred million dollar project, you're looking at hundreds of millions of dollars in CapEx to develop the site. So let me get to the punchline here, right? We talked about the 45Q tax credit, that $25 difference. It really does incentivize the emitter to send their, their uh, CO2 to the storage. Without low cost. Uh, availability of CO2, those oil reserves in the Powder River will remain stranded. They will not come out of the ground. So our proposal to you is that you look at taking the severance tax revenue generated by EUR projects that are sourced from Wyoming power plants and take a portion of that and bring it back to the emitter. Right? And if you think about the example I gave of a 50 million um, barrel target it generates 225 million. If you uh, look at taking 50% of that over a 20 year life of a project, um, you will ultimately wind up with about a $5 a ton benefit back to the emitter. So that you say, well, that's only five out of 20. A little bit of difference in the two places where CO2 can go. So in a dedicated storage site, as our friends at Frontier, it's the same business model Denver has. It's a fee for service, right? So we're going to charge you a fee to transport and store your CO2. We've said publicly that number runs about $15 to $25. A lot goes into that. How far away are you? What's the competition for storage sites? You take the midpoint of that, $20, bucks, you're charging that to the emitter who's getting $85 credit. That leaves him with $65 net back. Uh, off of that credit. If that same CO2 goes to EOR, he's going to get $60 a ton from on 45Q. 
there is a pipeline that has to connect them that's probably going to run about five dollars so they're going to net back fifty five dollars if that severance tax revenue can generate in the neighborhood of five dollars that means we're only looking at a five dollar delta that turns to the oil and gas industry to say and at reasonable oil prices we could probably make up that difference what we're trying to do here is get the whole thing on parity right and again this idea of capturing co2 that's uh, generated here in wyoming and putting it to use to generate yet additional value so not only all severance tax but job creation and the knock-on effect of, of industry as it grows so with that i'll close happy to take any questions yeah what's what's a portion of the severance that you're interested in how much uh well here we use an example of 50 percent Okay. So if you think back in time, uh, Wyoming did this in a way years ago where they reduced the severance tax from 6 to 4% to incentivize enhanced oil recovery. Questions, committee? Committee? Gentleman next to you, would you like to speak? No, I'm just here for moral support. Very good. All right. Committee, any further questions? Pete, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to present this. So the reason why we wanted to present the concept to you today, and uh, as you heard Matt discuss, the idea is that the federal government has is is using the tax code to push towards permanent storage. That's fine. It is what it is. It's it's in law. It's happening. Most of my members that are in this space are working towards that, and that has its place, and it's great. What we have experienced in Wyoming is treating carbon as a commodity for use in our existing and legacy oil fields to produce hydrocarbons. And because of that differential, as Matt said, the needle is moving towards permanent storage. I don't have any problem with that so far as it goes, but Wyoming can think about it in terms of what can we do to incentivize pushing carbon towards productive use, uh, both theoretically in reuse and manufacturing, though that's different than what Matt has suggested, but also in EOR. And so when he's talking about, to your question, Senator Doxeter, about how much severance, um, we, we need some more time to think about that. And what we want this committee to do is to uh, move the idea forward and we'll come back. We've asked uh, the School of Energy Resources uh, to dive, dive a little more deeply into the numbers about how this would work. Um, but the idea is that uh, the the revenue from the EOR project goes back to fund whatever the credit is. That could be severance, as um, Denberry has suggested. There's also current statutory language that exempts uh, from ad valorem taxation uh, equipment for pollution control. Carbon capture equipment is not included in that currently, but it could be, and it is in Texas. So that's another possibility of a way to uh, to provide an, an, a, just an incremental exemption that pushes that needle towards carbon as a productive use in Wyoming, uh, in addition to the long-term storage. Because like I said, that's going to be necessary no matter what. But uh, but to the extent we can push to productive use, all to the benefit of Wyoming. Thank you. So, do, you do you anticipate SCR giving you a template to work from or what? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? SCR, you, you're going to ask them for a template on how you're going to do this? No, you're Mr. Chairman, what we've had preliminary discussions about is, is Denberry have brought you an example uh, of one of their fields and what it could look like uh, uh, there, uh, a possible possible field there, but that's just one. What we'd like to do is, is uh, have uh, the folks at SCR take a closer look at, at the numbers, sharpen the pencils and see if we did a 3% severance what would that mean um uh what what what's possible out there in terms of of eor potential that sort of thing so that we can have a little bit more detail for you to move forward to move it towards legislation because it would require uh legislation right thank you committee for pete anything go ahead um when would you expect thank you mr chairman uh when would you expect to have maybe something like that in terms of preliminary information for some kind of economic impact of different possibilities. Uh, Mr. Chairman, when? President Lally, I, I don't want to put words in SDR's mouth. I think um, uh, Dr. Krutka could probably talk a little bit about it. They've indicated to us that it's potential they could have something for you by your next meeting. Mm -hmm. Quicker than I thought. Okay, go ahead. Anything else? Okay, we're good. 
Okay, thank you. Thank Gentlemen, you, Mr. Appreciate Chairman. It. Thank you for traveling to Wyoming. Let's do this. We're at 3, 340. Let's, let's pick up the pace. Let's hear from Black Hills. Let's hear from Rocky Mountain Power and Black Hills. And then we need to work in DEQ this evening before we leave because they have other responsibilities tomorrow. Let's, um, Rocky Mountain Power, gentlemen. We're just going to push over just a little bit, but go ahead, gentlemen. Good afternoon. There we go. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the committee. My name is uh, Dick Garlish. I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs and General Counsel for Rocky Mountain Power. And with me here today is Rick Kaysen, who's our contract lobbyist. Um, appreciate the opportunity to, to come visit with the committee today. Um, I thought I would focus our discussion on where we are with our process with uh, HP 200 compliance and what we learned so far uh, and what we think the next steps are and how that might relate to the focus of today's discussion. Um, so first, as far as HP 200 compliance goes, we have an obligation to um, you know, look for a CCUS project in Wyoming. That's part of our obligation under HP 200, but also our consent decree with the EPA. So we identified two facilities um, that were potential for CCUS projects in our fleet. And I should probably note that, you know, we were talking about a retrofit of existing coal plants with a new CCUS technology uh, and not a new from scratch project. And what we've learned uh, in this process is that is uh, all CCUS de development is difficult, but retrofits are especially difficult. There's only been two retrofits uh, in the North America that have been six, that have been completed at a commercial scale, Petronova and Boundary Dam. Petronova is, is not running. It was not able to sustain itself for economic reasons, even though they proved the technology. And Boundary Dam continues to run. And just for perspective, those were billion dollar projects that uh, both received somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 million a piece in governmental subsidies. Um, to, to, to move forward. So it's a difficult process. So when we look at our units, uh, you know, our units are on the older side, um, but DJ4 and Jim Bridger were selected as the most likely candidates within our fleet because they have more, they're younger, younger, and they have more um, existing emissions controls and technology that make them more compatible with an amine-based uh, approach to carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Uh, why I mean based? Because that is the technology. We focused on that because that is the technology to date that has been successful. Um, so we had an RFP process. Um, actually, we started out with an REOI process. We got expressions of interest from um, a lot of different areas of the sectors and moved into an RFP. And what, what we've really learned is that today, in today's market, there is nobody that has a turnkey solution. There is no one vendor that can show up with, able to do the construction of the CCUS, has the technology, can has the sequestration solution, has the supply, one stop. It, it's a consortium, uh, so several partners. And we're fortunate that in our RFP process, we did get a, a proposal and financing is a big part. We did get a proposal that had a consortium that included uh, the universe, Enchant Energy, University of Wyoming, Sargent and Lundy, Kiwit, Oxy Low Carbon Adventure, and Cone Resonant Capital. But this consortium are are people that have either the knowledge, uh, the knowledge, technology, technology, or they have part of the puzzle. They don't have the whole puzzle. So in order to move forward with a project on Bridger or Dave Johnson, you know, we've, we're learning that we need like a consortium of providers to be able to to move forward with the project. In addition to that, we, you know, as a regulated utility, you know, our obligation is low, least cost, least risk supply for our customers. And so when we look at ownership structures, 
we're, we're looking at a structure, at least at this point, that is somebody that we can sell our gas stream to, our, our slip gas that they can sell our CO2 to, CO2 to, and that they would build their facility on the other side of the fence. We'd build them basically a line. They would take it, sequest the carbon, and then um, use it in enhanced oil recovery or some other application storage, permanent storage. So in terms of you know revenue taxes and credits um we see that that's probably like a peripheral impact to us and not a direct impact or benefit but it will definitely impact um you know where how we get these bids and how we move forward with a, a project because it will all be part of the consortium's economics in in some regard um so that's that's sort of a high level. I'm trying to snap along because I know we're short on time. So maybe I'll just stop there and ask if there's questions on either the IRP process or where okay. we're at. You're happy with HB 200? I think the governor's office walked back out of the room so you can speak. Um, happy. HB 200 is a reflection of what Wyoming, Wyoming is the leader in CCUS in the country. And that was an important tool for helping move CCUS forward. I think we've learned some things in the process. Where where we are, where the technology is, especially with respect to availability of a retrofit, um, and where we are today is a big gap. Um, and so I think there are some things that 200 could do to help incentivize, whether that's, um, you know, acknowledging some, you know, different types of projects that are test scale, bench scale, um, to prove out some of the you know, challenges that are related to going completely commercial and economic, that would be helpful. Uh, incentivizing or aligning incentives from federal and state. Uh, and the state's done a lot. Um, I should mention that coming out of this um, RFP process, another thing we're learning from the consortium is, yeah, they did enough work to look at it and say, yeah, this is this is a feasible project in this area. But in order to take the next step to making it an actionable project, putting steel on the ground and doing all those kinds of things, requires another round of very high, highly detailed studies in the form of a feed study. And a feed study, as my understanding is, can range anywhere from you know, $5 million to $10 million plus and take 12 to 18 months. Uh, but it's an important part of the step to really, because that's where you get into what is it really going to cost for the concrete and all of the engineering, the groundwork mm -hmm. to be able to, to understand what that project is. And the governor's office making the $40 million available recently, they had an announcement about that. I think will be very helpful. So there's a, there's a lot of good things going on. If we could just kind of align them a little bit, uh, I think it would help us focus on what we could do to close the gap on where we are with where the technology is and where we want to be from a policy perspective and an operation perspective. Thank you. Good follow up on the compliment, but I think somebody helped them get that money too. <laughs> well, let's go to Rick and then save your questions and we'll ask both of them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. But again, uh, in the spirit of time, since we're already an hour behind, and again, we'll just go with uh, Mr. Garlish's comments unless you have a specific question for Committee me. Many questions for either one. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen, thank you for your patience today. Thank you. Okay, let's move uh, straight to Black Hills Energy. Also speaking of patient, they've been pacing the floor. Black Hills, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, David Bush, Black Hills Energy, Government Affairs. Uh, with me today is Mark Lux, our Vice President of Power Delivery, and Derek Silbaugh, who's our Director of Power, De Power Delivery and Engineering. Um, I'm going to turn it over to them to give you kind of the the specifics uh, of where we are with House Bill 200 and and any other subjects you have on our carbon capture, but um, they traveled from Rapid City, so long drive. I'd like them to. I think Rapid City is even harder to get here from than Dallas. Go ahead. <laughs> it is. Which one of you first, sir? Yeah, my name is Mark Lux, and um, I'm the executive sponsor for House Bill 200. But what I'd like to start off with today is uh, thank you to uh, Chairman Burkhart, Chairman Dockstetter, and the commission for allowing us a short opportunity to share uh, a little bit with you about how we see legislation and how we see House Bill 200 uh, relative to Black Hills. When we look at successful legislation, we look at it through the lens of our primary focus, which is our customers and three primary goals. Those goals are first, to provide safe, reliable energy. Second, to provide that energy at the lowest cost. 
And third, to provide and uh, make investments that provide customer benefit. So when we think about legislation that's successful, it aligns with our core principles around this customer focus. So as we look at House Bill 200, um, we see House Bill 200 very positively uh, on the onset for the following reason. It provided a framework for Black Hills Energy to focus and understand what carbon capture would really look like on our existing coal-fired generation located in Gillette, Wyoming. Without that House Bill 200, I'm not sure uh, with our limited resources, we would have taken the time to prioritize and focus in to learn what we've now learned since 2020. We have done a lot with House Bill 200 uh, to share just some real key highlights. You know, we have toured some of these projects. You heard about the Boundary Dam project. Boundary Dam project is one of the projects that's a 150 megawatt coal plant that is now a 110 megawatt coal plant because it takes that much power to run the carbon capture process. So you have to replace that 40% uh, energy loss with something. Just to compress the CO2 to the levels you've heard about today to get it to a super critical state at that Boundary Dam project, it takes one motor, that's 17 megawatts. That's the size of a city of 15,000 to 20,000 population. That is a big motor. So that's 12% of the 40% of the energy just to compress that CO2, just to give you an example. Um, additionally, uh, we have filed with DOE in partnership with development companies that are exploring technologies that aren't commercial today. And if we're successful with those, we would like to have the ability to be able to explore some of those technologies because they may be more economical and aligned with our customer focus. Today, House Bill 200 is really focused and constraining on the technologies that are available. So very simply, um, when you think about thermal generation, it is important to our customers. I think you would all agree that when the wind's not blowing, the sun's not shining, it's thermal energy that gives you the lifestyle and keeps your lights on. So we really rely on uh, thermal generation. To give you an example of that, during the recent storm uh, you know, over Christmas, Storm uh, Erie, what happened with our customers uh, we served nearly 100% of the energy with our coal uh, energy. When it got so cold, the wind turbines trip off at minus 20 degrees. Coal plants are designed uh, to minus 40. So they start backing down below zero, and they do that to protect the wind turbines so they don't uh, have uh, physical damage. So uh, thermal energy is very, very critical to our customer focus principles. So we need to make House Bill 200 work if we're gonna move forward with it. And we need primarily two things. We need uh, ability to continue to uh, advance uh, the technology and we need more time. We have to file our final report in March of 2024 as to how we intend to comply by 2030. Very simply, if you look at the Inflation uh, Reduction Act, if the timeline would be aligned with the timeline of the Inflation Reduction Act, that would be helpful just as an example. Uh, as it relates to technology, I wanna share a quick story before I close. And that's a story of Black Hills pioneering technology back in 1969 with air-cooled condensing. In 1969, there was not a single air-cooled condensed thermal power plant in the United States. Air-cooled condensing was not a proven technology. Today, the only proven technology for carbon capture is uh, Rocky Mountain Power shared is the amine processes. Those are the processes that we just shared on the Boundary Dam. The air-cooled condenser was approved by a commission back in 1969 based on a risk that air-cooled condensing would work and would be able to provide low-cost, reliable energy in an area of Wyoming that didn't have water, but had a lot of good fuel, low cost coal. So that project was developed in 1969, taking on that risk. Five years later, a 350 megawatt plant was built between uh, Rocky Mountain Power and Black Hills, which is the WIADAC plant. And since that time, Black Hills has built four more air-cooled coal plants and Dry Fork was built through uh, Basin Electric. So without taking that risk in 1969 on a technology that wasn't proven, 
wasn't commercially viable, did not meet the best utility practice and prudent utility practice that we are required as an investor owned utility today to uh, uh, comply with, we wouldn't have as much benefit to Wyoming as we see today. So I see this carbon capture in a similar vein where we need a little bit of time and we need more technology investment to make the right choices. And the right choices may or may not be carbon capture on the existing plants. They may be building some new technology on a pilot level that then expands to even more coal use for the long-term future. So I wanna to close today first by saying thank you for uh, giving us time today, but we have several suggestions that we would like to follow up with uh, with you, Chairman uh, Doc Stetter, Chairman Burkhart, and this uh, uh, committee as it relates to ideas that we have that we think are reasonable to help make House Bill 200 a success. Sure. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Could you give those to the co-chairs, those suggestions, please? And we can develop those. Good connection. Okay. Yep. And we'll definitely do that, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Good presentation. Thank you. Did you like want to speak, sir? I don't have anything to add. Okay. Six questions. All right. Committee, any questions? Okay. We'll take those suggestions and those recommendations and go over them with the committee. Thank you, sir, for coming. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Black Hills, any further comment on this? Okay. We're going to move straight into uh, Mr. Parford again on coal mining regulations. This is our, our only day with them, so we're going to get that done before we close out here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first off, uh, I'm Todd Parford again uh, with the Department of Environmental Quality, and with me is Kyle Wentland, the Land Quality Division Administrator, and Rio Barney, who is our blasting expert out of the Sheridan office. And the uh, purpose of the discussion is a little different than what we've been talking about all day, which has been uh, carbon sequestration. This is about blasting at non-coal uh, non mines. Uh, and we had done a review primarily because of the uh, increased activity we're seeing in the non-coal mining and uh, the uh, questions that had come up over uh, clarity and certainty as to who had the, the regulation and oversight of blasting at non-coal mines. So I'm going to turn it over to Kyle and he'll walk through our proposed uh, Sir? proposal. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Appreciate the time. Uh, as we walk through the slides, it's really, as, as the director had indicated, we're looking at an increased interest in mineral development, particularly gold, rare earth, aggregate, and deep seam bentonite. And we've seen an increase uh, in particular in the aggregate and the quarry type mining as well. And so we took that in-depth look and took some time and and to see where we fell with the non-coal blasting rules. The coal blasting rules are well-defined and they come out of the SMACRA program with the federal program for coal. So we took a good review of those and uh, and that we also looked at with in conjunction with workforce services as well and the state mine inspector because that's where we have some overlap. We, uh, as far as this presentation, we, we have some uh, recommended statutory revisions that would help add that clarity and certainty. And we'd like the committee's consideration of those today. And those revisions would also give the, the agency clear rulemaking authority here. And then lastly, on that note, we do believe that it would, in order to move this forward appropriately, it would require the addition of an FTE within the Land Quality Division and the Blasting Program. So in the course of that uh, search, Mr. we looked I through the Wyoming search. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Quick Mr. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I well, I've got the wrong distance of glasses, I understand Mr. How that works, believe me. I, I'm looking at the background slide, and the last one says training certification of non-coal blasters. Does DEQ do that, or does the state mine inspector or MSHA, or who does that? Mr. Chairman, that's an excellent question. Uh, Mr. Barney, who's with us today, actually teaches those certification classes. Uh, they're designed around the coal program primarily. 
Um, we do certify non-coal. And in that case, the state mine inspector also co-signs those certifications. So we do have uh, that program. We have seen a considerable increase in the attendance of those programs. We've had several classes that are now exceeding over 30 people. There's been a demand for additional classes. We've also helped the state of Utah and the state of Colorado. They have paid for their portion of that, but we have helped with their classes as well. Wyoming's really a leader in this part of the industry. Continue. Okay, continue. Mr. Chairman, when doing the deep dive in the Wyoming statutes first, and then we also took a, a deep look through the Interstate Mining Compact Commission, or IMCC, that Wyoming is a member, and asked what other states are doing. And we've seen uh, other states have some similar issues as far as this clarity issue and certainty. But based on that review, we looked at making revisions to Wyoming Statute 3511-401, 402, 406, and 415. In the course of that review, uh, we also uncovered uh, some handling and storage statutes that are outside of the, the land qualities wheelhouse here, but the committee may wanna consider taking a look at those. They were last updated based on the research we did in 1957. Um, so those- Chairman, Thank you, Mr. Wetland. Yes, Mr. So 3510-301-302-303. Whose wheelhouse are those in? Mr. Chairman, that's a really good question. I think it would probably fall more to the state mine inspector because it's on-site handling and storage. But I think it has a broader scope than the mining industry specific. So I think there's some more additional time that would need to be spent on where those authorities lie and who those authorities should rest with. Okay, thank you. Proceed. So with that, Mr. Chairman, we're gonna walk through our proposed statute revisions really quickly. When we look at statute 401, we're going to look at adding new language and creating a section G. Uh, and this is actually, what this language does is it gives us clear authority over blasting at limited mine operation notifications. For those on the committee that don't know, the division has really three principal permits. There's a the notification, which is a 15 acre limitation, a small mine permit and a regular large mine permit. We have quarry operations in LMOs. So we do have blasting in these LMOs and that blasting can be uh, where we're seeing urban sprawl. We are seeing interaction with the public and the community on those. So this, this language gets us authority over limited mine operations. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, uh, Senator Rothfuss. For the perhaps 10th time, I'll have to say something along the lines of remember the LMO. <laughs> Mr. Wetland, proceed. Somebody might not have heard that. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm just gonna move with that one. I'm with you. Um, so then we look at uh, Wyoming statute 3511-402 and we're adding a new section 3511-402 uh, small Romanet D and then a few sub Romanets in that. And what these particularly do is, uh, this is where it's gonna give us a clear rulemaking authority. And it it's it basically the, the key item here in these three Romanets uh, is little Romanet II or two. And that's where I wanna draw you to. This is where we would reference the National Fire Protection Code standards for non-coal blasting. And what I will tell you is, and if you have some technical questions here, this is why we have Mr. Barney here today, is there is some differences in the frequencies and the vibration wave that comes out of blasting in very hard material versus soft or semi-soft material. And those requirements and, and limitations are very different and have very different implications to the industries. So we wanted to make sure we're referencing the, the, right, the right standards out there, since specifically when we get to vibrations and high-pitched hard rock shots. 
So we reference those national fire protection codes and basically that would be an incorporation by reference. So it would help move these rules forward and not have to get into the statute as we get down the road with it. So Mr. Wentland, and in Romanet two, you indicate an and in there, including both the International Fire Code and the National Fire Protection Association um, code. Are there conflicts in those codes? Are they compatible with each other using the and? Mr. Chairman, they are most compatible using the and because one cross references into the other. Okay. So, and, and uh, my own follow up to that. So, in this, do we need to state a uh, edition of the code? Because I know NFPA revises, uh, they attempt to revise every code every three years. So, I mean, there's no no date here. You could go back and use the 1921 code if it exists. Do we need to establish an addition for these codes? Mr. Chairman, that's a, a very good question, a good recommendation. Our thought here was we were trying to keep this as broad as an incorporation by reference and address as much of that as we could in the rule. If the committee is more comfortable placing more um, Concise language may be the best way to phrase that within here. We certainly would have no objections. Okay, so proceed. No, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. This is where we continue in D and authorities, and this is where the we outline the protection to the public, basically, uh, where we look at offsite impacts that might come from vibration and air blast in particular. So the the Romanet 4 says, you know, we're going to limit or establish the types of explosives and detonating equipment, size, timing, frequency, blast upon the physical conditions. That's pretty standard language. It's with our pretty similar to what we have with coal. And then it talks about injury to persons, damage to public or private property outside the permit area, and adverse impacts in the event we may have an underground mine operation. So and then Mr. lastly, Mr. Wendlet, yes, should we include uh, oil and gas wells? Mr. Chairman, areas? we would have, that's a set structure. So we really address that in the rules on when we handle that in the coal side. I think that probably would be best addressed in the rules here. Okay. All right. Proceed. And then Romanet 5, um, we just require that they be conducted by an trained and confident person. This is the certification question that Mr. Chairman, you asked earlier. And we would again have the uh, recommend that the state mine inspector would co-sign these as well as our DEQ personnel and training people. Mr. Chairman, then we move to 3511-406. And the reason we established an ad new at Little Roman at B, 21 is, and we left B in here as a cross-reference. This is where we clearly separate that there's standards for coal, standards for non-coal. We do not want to get them intermixed. Uh, technically, like I said earlier, there are differences in the vibration limits, and we want to make sure that we don't intermix them here. And then... Mr. Chairman, lastly, with uh, 3511-415 duties of the operator, this helps us establish where, especially if we have a revision down the road in a permit, uh, that authority, and it also cross-references correctly back into 3511-406-B20, or B12. So we wanted to make sure we had the correct cross-references there and uh, make sure that all of those statutes interact correctly. And in summary, Mr. Chairman, uh, we're recommending that we update these statutes. Uh, it's going to give uh, a little more clarity, a lot more clarity, and, and a lot more certainty to both the public and industry in this case. And I would add on that note that in our discussions with industry, and particularly the explosives industry, they like standards. They can design these shots to the standards they need to meet, provided they know what those standards are. And right now that's not specifically clear. Um, 
Again, we would suggest that you maybe consider or look further into uh, statutes 301 through 303, 3510. And then uh, we are also, again, asking for an FTE with this because right now, uh, what I can tell you is Mr. Barney is, is supporting some seismographs and things for non-coal. Um, we are full in coal and we are full in non-coal and just the training and where we are. And it's a good thing that we're seeing expansion like gold, rare earths, uh, some of the deeper seam bentonite, but that's also adding a workload here. And we need to make sure we can address that workload accordingly. So we're, we're asking for that FTE. Representative Conrad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Whitland, just a question, and I apologize in advance. Would, with your proposed statutory updates or suggestions, would this impact those entities who are not who are utilizing blasting for non-mining purposes, as specifically storage silos, cleanup, et cetera, and so forth? Mr. Chairman, Mr. It, Mr. Chairman and Representative Conrad, that is not in the intent. This is for specifically for mining operations. But if that work is going uh, to, sorry. Representative Conrad. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Wendler, would, but if that blasting is occurring on a mining site, is that still outside of the scope? Mr. Wetland? Mr. Chairman and Representative Conrad, it would not be. Um, those would be, I would have, I'm going to have to ponder that one a little bit more. Maybe it's better to address that more specifically in the rule than in the statute. I understand your point and your concern. I would add that a demolition shot like that is probably a much smaller shot. Uh, so I, I'll have to, I, I'm not sure I can totally answer that question today to be be frank about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Wendland, anything further? Mr. Chairman, just my last slide, and I think those on the committee know that I always use this opportunity to showcase what Wyoming Reclamation does for Wyoming. And uh, that's a that's a picture out of my slide deck that I love. Um, I don't know if they can put it back up, but uh, considering the impacts to mule deer this year, that was a pretty happy mule deer that summer. Okay, thank you. Any questions for DQ on the suggested blasting revisions for non-coal mining? Okay. Representative Heiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Wendley, uh, I, I don't know if we do this, but with our gravel operations, do we do any blasting within the state for gravel operations? Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Rep Representative Heiner, for Santa Gravel loose aggregate, no, but we do see it in quarry and we do have quarry for aggregate. So. Okay. Oh, thank you. With that, uh, I think I'll stick with this one for a moment, but I do want to eventually go to the state mine inspector. Uh, so public comment on proposed changes to non-coal blasting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Travis Detai with the uh, Wyoming Mining Association, and I'll only need about 40 minutes to, to go go through my comments. Uh, we're we're we're. Uh, if you forget, Mr. Detai, I have a small wooden hammer. <laughs> Point taken, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're supportive of the of the uh, agency's recommendations, and um, Mr. Wentland kind of pointed out uh, with the uptick that we're seeing with with the gold and with the rare earths. Uh, I was in a meeting with the, uh, the BLM state director earlier this week and uh, was informed that we've also got exploration going on in uh, the western part of the state for nickel, cobalt, hard rock uh, lithium, uh, titanium, and monazite. So uh, that's a good thing. And I think I look at this as getting our regulatory ducks in a row. Uh, as we as we look to expand our mining pro profile for the non-coal side. So uh, supportive of the recommendations, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. 
Other comments? Uh, Mr. Okay. Chairman, uh, Mr. member Beggar, of the committee, please. Uh, Jason Beggar, on behalf of U.S. Gold Corporation, who is developing a gold and copper mine on a state lease about 20 miles west of Cheyenne. Um, a lot of these issues are issues that uh, came up throughout the company's permitting process. Last September, the company did submit their uh, permit the mine to the Land Quality Division. And uh, this particular issue uh, created a lot of back and forth. We were working through it, but uh, this type of legislation would certainly clear up that particular issue. And um, yeah, uh, DQ has been fantastic to work with on, on the whole project itself. But uh, anything we can do to try to create clarity and expedite the process is helpful. That would answer any questions. Any questions? Maybe any questions? Okay, thank you. Any other public testimony? Anybody yeah. online? Mr. Chairman, we do have one person online. He gets one minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, Dan Benford, Inter Interim Executive Director of AGC of Wyoming. Um, thank you for letting me speak online. I will just say that we are involved in this conversation and we are generally in support of this as well. Okay, thank you. Any, any questions for AGC? Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brentford, very much. Thank you. Committee, with that, any of anyone else? Sean, do you want to speak on this issue? Okay. <laughs> with that, I'll close public testimony. Okay, committee? Want a draft? I would like a motion to draft. Yes. Okay. Make a motion. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we begin the draft legislation in, in accordance with what's been presented by DQ. Okay. Is there a second? Sure. Seconded by Mr. Co Chairman. All in favor say aye. Aye. All, right. All opposed, no. Okay. Brian, got it. Okay. And you can work with the department on the wording. I think there's some improvements in there. So, with that, if Inspector Krupa, if you would just wait with us, please. Um, I, I hate to do this. We kind of overlooked Mr. Taylor. He's been sitting patiently all day. So, Mr. Taylor, if you'd please come up. And we're going to change. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. So, Mr. Taylor, please. We apologize. Uh, we're trying to go by this list, and somehow your name wasn't on it. My fault. No worries, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you. Um, I am not Pete Obermuller, and I'm not DEQ. So uh, I'm Sean Taylor. I'm the Executive Director of the Wyoming Rural Electric Association. And uh, in consultation with the co-chairs, um, because you had heard from the other utilities that asked if I would want to come and speak to the committee. And I'm going to do something a little bit different, though, um, because uh, we talked about doing kind of a short co-op 101, um, maybe as a refresher course for those that have been around and, and maybe uh, some new information for those that maybe aren't quite familiar with the, with the rural electric co-ops. And I will tie it into the issue of the day, CCUSA. And so um, bear with me. I was going to apologize to those in the room uh, and uh, Representative Nat because they'll hear the same uh, presentation to corporations at the end of the month, but nobody's left. So I'll just apologize to Representative Knapp. Um, so I'm going to give you just a, a quick co-op 101. So cooperatives, whether you're a rural electric co-op or a food co-op or a propane co-op, we all are governed by the same uh, guiding principles. Um, they're voluntary and open membership. Anybody can move into a co-op service territory and, and take power. Uh, they're democratic member owner controlled. If you are a customer of a co-op, you are an owner, part owner of the co-op. And all the owners of the co-op elect their uh, board of directors from their neighbors and other uh, customers, owners of the co-op. Um, that's number two. Members' economic participation. We are not-for-profit utilities, um, so we budget everything at cost. And anything that is left over at the end of the year that is uh, in would be considered a profit, we return back to our our members, our customers, our owners. 
Um, autonomy and independence is the next one. And that's, uh, we like the saying it in the co-op world, if you've seen one co-op, you've seen one co-op. Um, while we're all governed by the same uh, guiding principles, and there's a lot of similarities to the rural electric co-ops in Wyoming, uh, they're each individual. Um, and they, they, they answer only to their board and to their owners, their customers. Uh, the next one is education, training, and information. Uh, this applies to our directors, to our employees, and our owners. Um, Representative Lolly and Senator Cooper, I just ordered you guys in the neck of the woods in Tent Sleep in Burlington. Uh, Bighorn REA hosted a couple of dist dif different district meetings, and they talked to the, the customers, their owners, about um, some, some rate issues and some other issues that are going on within Bighorn. Um, with that education aspect, I'm, I don't know how many people even knew that we did this, but several years ago, the co-ops um, funded and stood up the cooperative business model class at the University of Wyoming in the College of Ag, um, because we, the more we talked to people, everyone was like, the, the co-op business model isn't taught anywhere in school. So we started that class over at UW. And then the last two guiding principles are uh, two of my favorite, um, cooperation among cooperatives. Um, for example, uh, you all might remember the weather anomaly that happened over in Jackson several years ago in Lower Valley Energy's uh, service territory, blew down a bunch of uh, really big poles and wires, and we had um, some neighboring co-ops in Wyoming and even from other states uh, run over and help them get stood back up uh, probably quicker than they would have been able to do on their own. So that cooperation among cooperatives is a great one. And then the last one is concern for community our, our co-ops and our directors and our employees are, they're all very involved in their local communities, whether through volunteer or running for a school board or other elected positions. Um, it's the concern for a community that drives everybody um, to make the co-op business model work. So that, those are our, our guiding principles. Nationally, there's about 900 uh, co-op serving one in every eight uh, US citizens. Collectively, we serve 92% of America's persistent poverty counties. Uh, the co-ops truly are in all of the above energy mix. Um, we have co-ops that have uh, even that serve in, in Wyoming, which I'll get to in a second, um, oil, gas, coal, uh, wind, solar, uh, hydro, everything you can think of, the co-ops do. Some of that is driven by regulation and legislation in states, um, but some of it is, and, and much of it is, is member-driven, um, owner-driven. Our owners, if they want more renewables, then our co-ops work to, work to do that. Um, and Co-ops create co-ops. Um, so back 80, 90 years ago when the co-ops in Wyoming were formed, um, they, bought, they bought power on the open market. And then they decided, well, let's start another co-op, a generation and transmission co-op, GNTs are what we call them. And so they joined with other co-ops to form these GNTs that built all the power plants and the big transmission lines. So the GNTs are the ones that get the power to the distribution co-ops that you all might be familiar with. Uh, in Wyoming, and I, I passed out this map um, hope you all have that, uh, just kind of for a visual reference. And also, I, I hope you all received this recently. Um, we sent this out to all the legislators, and this gives a, a little deeper dive on each co-op and covers some of the stuff that I'm talking about today. But in Wyoming, we have 11 distribution co-ops. We do have three what we call associate um, members, and they're co-ops headquartered outside of Wyoming, but serve a sliver of the, of the state, like Bags, um, Clark, Wyoming, um, Alta. And they belong to the association as well. And then, as I mentioned, we have three generation and transmission cooperatives that also belong to our association. That's Tri-State GNT out of uh, Denver. And they serve eight of our co-ops in Wyoming. So they provide wholesale power to eight of the co-ops across Wyoming. Um, then we have Basin Electric out of Bismarck. Um, they serve one co-op, but it's our largest co-op um, up in Representative Tarver's neck of the woods. And um, then we have uh, Deseret, closer to here, they're out of Salt Lake, and they serve a small portion of, of uh, Wyoming um, down in the in uh, Representative Conrad's area in the Bridger Valley. And those all those three GNTs also belong to the association. And then uh, in Senator Dockstader's uh, co-op in his neck of the woods, they receive a majority of their power, not from a GNT, but from Bonneville Power. Um, it's a federally, um, a federal, what do you call it? PMA, right? Um, so they, and they are the beneficiary of a lot of, of hydro. And I would be remiss if I didn't say uh, Lower Valley Energy, uh, I believe still has the lowest rates in the country. Yep, I need to know it. Um, and that's, like I said, they're the beneficiary of some, what's that? Yes, full disclosure. Um, again, in Wyoming, uh, we serve a little over 62,000 square miles. 
of the of the state's territory, with our smallest uh, being 170 square miles and our largest uh, being Powder River Energy, again, up in Representative Tarver, that's 15,660 um, square miles. We have a little over 119,000 meters served in all 23 counties. I was looking and and a majority of the committee uh, serves or represents um, some portion of a rural electric co-op. There's a few that don't have any, but um, we do serve in all 23 counties. Um, Lord, uh, like I said, um, one thing I did want to point out when we were talking about CCUS and everything, um, Powder River Energy, um, they, they provide power to most of the coal mines up in the Powder River Basin, and they were integral in the coal bed methane uh, development back in the late 1990s and early 2000s, um, building out to uh, all these different sites where the coal bed methane was being drilled and, and pumped up. Um, we have about 35,000 miles of distribution lines, so that's 3.9 members per mile. So for every mile or three point, or for every mile of line, transformers, poles, substations, whatever has to go into that, that's serving an average of 3.9 people. So that kind of gives you an idea of what we deal with in the, in the rural electric co-op where we don't have the density that the investor-owned utilities have. And for example, you know, the, the reason we were formed um, is because when an investor-owned utility um, takes a look, they're looking at the return on investment, right? So I was thinking about this um, throughout the day. Over in this neck of the woods, you have uh, Rocky Mountain Power Series, Rock Springs, Green River, population centers, even up here in Kimmer, they got the coal mine and the power plant. So they kind of come up and move up this way. And then they go over to Evanston and there's that little valley, like I mentioned, Bridger Valley, um, where they must have looked at it and the towns of Mountain View and Lyman and Fort Bridger, um, not a good re return on investment to serve those folks. And so Bridger Valley was one of the co-ops that started. And that's the same story all across the state with the, uh, the 10 other, uh, other co-ops. Um, and not only to serve those small rural communities, but to serve the ranch or the farm that's 20 miles away from town. Um, that's what the co-ops were created to do. And all of this is governed by 78, like I said, duly elected directors, and they're operated by extremely dedicated and competent general managers, linemen, accounts, and numerous other inside and outside staff. Going back to the uh, commitment to or concern for community, we all have a, a program called Operation Roundup, where we ask our members to voluntarily round their uh, utility bill up to the next dollar, and those pennies uh, add up and add up, and, and the, the co-ops um, have a, board, or a foundation that decides um, where to spend that money, and it's families in need, it's a, if it's a new town that, or a town that needs a new fire truck, um, you name it, and, and this Operation Roundup is, is helpful in the, in the various communities that we operate in. Um, getting a little more utility focused, um, 10 of the 11 co-ops are non-rate regulated by the Public Service Commission. Um, this was legislation that we passed, I believe, back in 2005. Um, our argument for that is that we're self, we're self-regulated, we're self-governed. We, you know, our our owner elects their board member, um, which could be their neighbor. Our board members pay the same rates, and because we're not for profit, there's no reason for us to artificially inflate our rates if we're only going to give it back. And so we were successful in getting that legislation passed. The one co-op that remains rate regulated is Powder River Energy, and it's because they have such uh, large industrial loads with the coal mines up there that they felt that they would rather have the Public Service Commission kind of as a backstop um, for their rate making. Um, real quickly, the legislative and regulatory concerns that we are concerned about both at the nation and at, at the state level, numerous proposed rules, regulations, and legislation, legislative proposals uh, that threaten reliability. Our key goal is to provide reliable, affordable power, and that reliability seems to be threatened every day by new regulations coming out of the EPA, the Forest Service, BLM, you name it. Uh, and then at the at the uh, state level, this is all divided up into certificated service territories. So this is this is where Powder River can operate. This is where Bridger Valley can operate. And the rest of it is all Rocky Mountain Power, to some extent Black Hills, and then MDU is another uh, small one up in the northern part of the state. And you don't go outside those boundaries or you don't cross those lines unless there's an agreement between the neighboring utilities. Um, that's been threatened in the past. We ran a bill this past year um, that didn't get out of the Senate. So the House folks, uh, you never had a chance to, to see it. Um, and we're, we've asked the Corporations Committee to um, take that up as an interim topic because it's vitally important for us to protect that territory. Now I can stop there with the 101 and answer any questions, and then I can tie it back into CCUS 
if you want me to, I got like a half a page left, but I know it's the end of the day and I need to hit the road to go back to Cheyenne. So, Mr. Taylor, I haven't seen any questions. And that, oh, Representative Conrad. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Taylor, thank you. Just a quick question. Is, is any of your power exported to AKA California, Oregon, et cetera, or is it primarily Wyoming? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Representative Conrad, and that's a distinction that I need to make clear. The 11 distribution co-ops, they don't generate any power. Um, well, that's not true. Um, they may have, in, in the Lower Valley's case, they have some hydro that they built on their own. Um, they all have requ all requirements contracts with their GNTs. So Tri-State headquartered out of out of uh, Denver, they that serves the eight co-ops in Wyoming. Uh, yeah, they they have all kinds of power that they sell on the open market, or it goes to our two power plants. We, there are two co-op uh, owned and operated power plants in Wyoming. One is the Laramie River Station uh, outside of Wheatland, and then the other one is Dry Fork and. Uh, owned by Basin Electric up in Gillette. So yeah, and they would export whatever excess, but they take care of their members first. And and Tri-State, they, they're made up of 41 other co-ops in three other states. They're called Tri-State, but they operate before. Basin Electric has a, a huge footprint going east. Um, and so they have a lot of power, but they take care of their members first in any excess power they sell on the open market. So... Mr. Taylor, I'd say go ahead and, and move into the, the CCUS impacts to you. All right. I'll 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 try to tie this up in a nice little bow. Um, we are very interested in, in CCUS. Um, the Integrated Test Center, which I know you'll hear more about tomorrow, was partially funded not only through state funds, but uh, Tri-State kicked in $5 million to go to the ITC. Um, our National Trade Association, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, kicked in a million dollars for the ITC. And then, of course, it's hosted at a co-op power plant at Dry Fork. And uh, they work very closely with the operations folks at Dry Fork and the ITC folks. So we are very supportive of it. Um, I would say Basin is probably the, has the most experience with it. They have a subsidiary called Dakota, Dakota Gasification. And it's currently a partner in one of the largest CO2 storage projects in the world. Uh, CO2 is captured from their coal gasification process at the Great Plains Senfuels plant up in North Dakota and has been sent to Canada for enhanced oil recovery since 2000. They've sequestered over 43 million tons of CO2 uh, to date. And then more recently, they've been looking to explore carbon capture and storage for electric generation to reduce CO2 emissions while also maintaining reliability because that's our key goal. And from 2008 to 2010, Basin conducted a feed, stu a feed study, which um, I believe Mr. Garlish from uh, Rocky Mountain mentioned on capturing the CO2 from about 100 megawatts of flue, ga flue gas from this Antelope Valley Station in North Dakota. The feed study, which front end engineering and development, um, it demonstrated the CO2 capture sequestration and required modifications to the steam turbine and boiler would cost up to $500 million. It was determined that project was not economically feasible. However, and you guys have heard a lot about the 45Q tax credit today, that's making those economics come into focus a little bit better. And I think they'll fur further explore that. Uh, Tri-State and Deseret, the other two GNTs, uh, they've looked at uh, CCUS um, and it's not penciling out for them right now, but Tri-State, they conducted an extensive resource planning uh, every two or three years, I believe it is, to model portfolios that consider a wide array of available technologies along with dimensions, including cost and reliability and organized market participation. Uh, in 2023, in Tri-State's this year's resource planning, uh, they're including natural gas combined cycle with uh, CCUS, or I don't know if it's utilization, I think it's just carbon capture and storage um, as a technology option for that future um, resource planning. Um, in summary, the co-op supports CCUS both actively and theoretically and are working towards proving the technology and improving the economics, um, working with various other stakeholders. So that's your co-op 101. That's how we kind of tie into the whole discussion you've had today. I appreciate the time that the co-chairs gave me to, to um, help, you know, kind of enlighten folks on, on who the co-ops are, because you might have heard of us, but maybe not really knew who we were. So I have to answer any Conrad? questions. Mr. Chairman, thank you. In the form of a question, one of the things you did not mention, which I think you should, can you share with us your safety record? It's impressive. 
Uh, yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Taylor. Representative Conrad, I, I don't have statistics with you with on top of my head, but we do have a very stellar safety record um, from, again, from the smallest co-op, uh, Garland out of Powell, to our largest one, um, safety, along with reliability. Safety is actually priority number one. Um, reliability is priority number two. And so we do have a, a very stellar track record, and I appreciate you bringing that up. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, represent or Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I grew up in one of those small communities serviced by a local co-op, and in high school, I went to local co-op camp. Yeah. Um, do you guys still do that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Taylor. Senator Ellis, we do do that. We do uh, energy camp uh, in three different states. The camp isn't in Wyoming. Um, I don't know which one you went to, but um, we send kids to Colorado and Steamboat. Um, Idaho and then Nebraska has one as well. We've talked about starting our own in Wyoming. And then those kids can go out to Washington, D.C. In fact, we're getting ready to take about 20 kids out um, from Wyoming uh, that have gone through the energy camp and then went to Washington, D.C., where they learn more about co-ops. They learn about the government. They learn they they get to do a lot of cool stuff. I went there once when I started this job and I'd lived in D.C. for six years. And I, I went and saw stuff with those kids that I hadn't seen in, in six years. So it's a really cool opportunity for the, the youth. Okay. Right, Mr. Taylor, thank you. All right. Thanks again. I appreciate and, and I take I understand your son graduates tomorrow. No, he has a new st new student orientation at UW oh, okay. tomorrow. So I'm gonna hit the road and make it back for that. So I appreciate you all getting okay. the time. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Okay. So Thanks. if I could get the state mine inspector come up and the deputy director. I know you're not prepared to to really give us much, and I, but um, I think back to the blasting regulations. Um, I think pretty much they do not affect the state mine inspector's office. Am I correct, Mr. Chairman? Very little. Uh, if you would name and position for the record, absolutely, Mr. Chairman. My name is Heather Krupa. Or would you like to start? I'm sorry. Hello, my name is Liz Gagan, and I am the Deputy Director of the Department of Workforce Services. Okay. Heather Krupa, I'm the State Mine Inspector. So one question I do have is mentioned a potential review of 3510-301-302-304. Have you re reviewed those, and do you have an opinion on whether they need to be revised or just left alone, considering they haven't been changed since... 1957. Mr. Chairman, I have reviewed those and have also spoken with our Attorney General's rep, and it is not our authority. It actually falls under crimes and offenses under public health and safety. One thing that I want to note is that our jurisdiction and authority is limited to the mining operation, not the public and their health and safety. Okay. So if we, I want an answer to that question, I need to get a hold of that's a good DSI, question, Mr. Chairman. Department of, of or DCI or someone. I'm Mr. Chairman, I'm unsure. Nobody knows. I that, do not know. Yes. Okay. So I think that's something we probably should look into considering that uh, or at least hand it off to another committee, considering we haven't looked at those statutes for 70 years almost. Things get dated. Okay. Any questions for the state mine inspector or deputy director? Okay. Mr. Thank Chairman, you for hanging I... with us all day. We appreciate it. And that. Sure. So, yeah. and you're welcome if you want to come back sometime and go into great more detail on what you do for the committee. We are the minerals committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to sit before you. And if there's no further questions, we would like to, uh, to mention that we are in support of DEQ's recommendations. Okay, thank you. Okay, committee, any questions? Thank you very much. So with that, I think that wraps us up for the day. Mr. Fuller. Yep, Mr. Chairman, um, just to run through what the committee has requested. Please. Um, a letter to the Joint Appropriations Committee um, expressing support for um, the funding and positions for the Class Six program in DEQ, a bill draft for amendments to the unitization statutes, and then a bill draft to amend um, the non-coal blasting provisions um, of the environmental quality statutes. Mr. Chairman, the last thing I would note is um, 
a time change for starting tomorrow. Um, the agenda has us starting at 8 a.m. tomorrow and not 8.30. Yes, I, I did notice that. I didn't notice it was a change. So, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Ellis. I can't remember. Did we offer public comment on the last agenda item? Uh, the blasting? Yes, we did. Uh, Mr. Detai and Mr. Beggar spoke. Okay, with that committee. Uh, oh. Little housekeeping, if I could. Sure. Thank Mr. you, Co Chair. Have a little housekeeping uh, tonight. Uh, dinner at six. This is for the committee here and the governor's office over at a place called Luigi's. Just put it in your phone. Staff. And staff. Yes. And um, we'll have a presentation from uh, Terra Power and the Cameron Diamondville Chamber would also like to do a little presentation to Exxon Mobil for their carbon capture. So that'll be tonight. The food is great. And uh, he's only open one night a week, happens to be Thursday, and we'll be there. So, and it's really good food. Tomorrow, uh, you'll notice your lunch hour starts at 11. Uh, Lincoln 1, the school district will drop a bus by, and we will go up during our lunch break for two hours and have a quick tour, a look over of the uh, Kimmer coal mine operations. And then we'll go down to the site where the nuclear power plant will be and have a presentation on the existing power plant that's there now, Rocky Mountain Power's plant. So a lot of education in this trip. Does, just, just doesn't happen all at this table. It happens out in the field and we've got to put together. So I appreciate all of you joining us tomorrow afternoon as well, because we'll come back here and finish up the last of the meeting. So tonight is six at Luigi's uh, for a good presentation at the same time to tell you about future energy uh, possibilities. Okay.